Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to podcastjuice.net. My name is Michael Dean, and uh, of course, you are listening to the podcast on Prince. Uh, we got a special one for you today. I know you're going to enjoy it, uh, but before we get into our guest here, we got to welcome my man, also partner of the show, Mr. Big Sexy and Saxer. How are you? You know, I had a nice uh, rain-soaked week, got some work done, made changes to the game plan. Let's roll. I'm ready to do it. All right. All right. Well, without further ado, we got one of the, what I would say, one of the legends uh, from the Prince community. And uh, I would imagine from uh, his hometown, Minnesota, Minneapolis, a legend as well. Uh, so we want to welcome Mr. Michael Bland. Sir, how are you? I'm doing all right, man. How are you guys? Excellent. We're doing great. Thank you. Great. great. Well, uh, listen, man, uh, I've been looking forward to this for a minute. Uh, you know, he's kind of going, going back and forth on Facebook. Uh, so I really appreciate you, you know, sharing the time with us today and getting on the mic. Sure, man. I mean, I'm, I was getting a fair amount of static uh, <laughs> on my end from uh, a lot of the fans who uh, happen to be friends of mine or, you know, like relatively close associates going, have you been on Michael Dean's podcast yet? And I didn't even know about it. <laughs> oh, shit. And they just kept hassling me, man, until I finally looked around. You know, and started kind of uh, sort of just kind of what do they call it? Stalking your page, seeing what you were doing, what you were about. And uh, I think the first time I really said anything was when one of your friends jumped way out the box. And I was like, OK, <laughs> <Uh-oh>. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to let her live. She knows she ain't really ready for the truth. Hilarious. <laughs> and, uh, so I stayed away for a little while and then I started stalking again, but not saying so much. Mm. <laughs> so I, I I guess it's just time, bro. Yeah, he was he was trying to see was let this brother play himself and see see what he's about. <laughs> well, no, no, no. I mean, I just I oh, just wanted funny. to get a gauge for you know what the people out there really want to know about. For sure. For and sure. also, sorry, excuse me. How how honest I can be about things without you know causing too much of a ruckus. I mean, I'm <laughs> very much interested in telling the truth, irrespective of you know, how somebody's going to feel about it. And anybody who used to be on Prince.org, like I went on like a three day marathon. (laughs) I was like, ask me whatever you want. And, Mm. you know, uh, it was, there was a a wide range of questions, but uh, not a lot of uh, uh, positive feedback about the answers. (laughs) Well, you know, maybe we should call this episode, stay out your feelings because, uh, that's one thing that there's a lot going around these days. But well, let's go mm-hmm. ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, you know, that's funny. We can call it that because actually um, I'm I'm making plans to do my own podcast early next year called Tough Love. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Would you tell us about what? So what's Tough Love going to be about? Oh, Tough Love is going to be just about, I mean, pretty much what we're talking about right now. It's, the, you know, uh, but also it's it's most likely going to be geared more towards. Uh, what musicians talk about mm-hmm. and and how to get your game up, how to, how to stay on it, you know, how to, you know, how, what, what, what you really need to do if you're going to survive in this business as a musician in this day and age. Wow. Okay. When, the, mm-hmm. when is this uh, coming out? Is it in January? Oh, I don't have a date yet okay. exactly, but mm-hmm. I, it's, it's definitely, I'm talking to who I need to talk to and I'm, I, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting my, uh, my bearings together. I, I'll, I'll make a proper announcement. Okay. Well, man, yeah. Congratulations. Early congratulations. That's good. Yeah. 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 Well, well, thank you, Big Sexy and uh, Michael Dean. <laughs> Wait a yeah. minute. Your middle name is Anthony? Yes, sir. So is it. mine, man. We only one. Oh, wow. We got one word, one, <laughs> one name of separation. <laughs> That's what. Well, you know what's so funny now? You made me think about this. I don't, I don't remember which performance it was. It might have been on a new tour or something I used to watch all the time. And there was he Prince kept saying he was obviously saying Michael B, but in my mm-hmm. mind I heard Michael D, and I kept thinking this, this nigga's name is not Michael D. I'm like, How is so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so now that I know your middle name is Anthony, that's funny. That's well, funny. let me explain to you why he was doing that. Yeah, I was. Uh, that was the new tour, and uh, we were in England. I remember it vividly. We were doing sound check, and sometimes when Prince would say, "Good God." <laughs> I, I like I just be blank like I didn't I wasn't responsive to it and uh, I, it happened during the sound check at our first show at Wembley 
arena or not arena uh yeah arena uh, on the new tour I, he said good god and i was doing something else he said hey <laughs> this is what we're gonna do i'm gonna start calling your name out i'm gonna say michael b <laughs> and if you don't come in after that i'm gonna tell the accountant <laughs> every time he hears your name over the pa and he don't hear no music come after it dock your pay <laughs> so that's how it, how it how that happened <laughs> And so, for that seven years, Michael B. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when the money start getting, exactly. you, know, <laughs> you get tight real quick. That's really how that happened. That's hilarious. And then after that, I mean, it just, I mean, I, of course, as time went on, I made less mistakes, but he, he kind of just stuck with it. And it, I it actually, uh, was became more of a term of endearment rather than you know <laughs> getting called on the carpet. Man, man, yeah. man. Okay, well let, let's uh, let me. I want to back this up. So for those who don't know, of course you were the drummer for Prince for like what seven years in terms of being seven years. Man? Yeah, straight. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so uh, before we get into you getting with Prince, though, I, I, I don't know a lot about you before that. Like, um, you're from Minneapolis? Is that yes, right? sir. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, man, I see you. You were born in 69. Shit, I was in 60. So you, welcome, well, you should welcome me to the 50 Club, but we, we in the 50 Club. All right, <laughs> my birthday is in March. When, when's your uh, November? I just had one. Just okay, all right. well, con- congratulations, you made it, man. <laughs> I made it. Right? Where's, where's my roses? I thought I was supposed to be done now. <laughs> Give me my flowers while I get live. Exactly. Shit. Hey, man. <laughs> but um, man, so tell us about your upbringing in terms of uh, you born and raised. Are you born and raised in Minneapolis? Uh, yes, but my um, the rest of my nuclear family uh, moved up here from. Bogalusa, Louisiana. Yeah, uh, okay. Yep. Whoa. So uh, yeah, right. I heard Country folk. Mm-hmm. They didn't get sidewalks till probably 1984. <laughs> <laughs> I was kicking dust with all the other kids. You know, every summer down there we vacation, mm-hmm. and uh, I guess you know music was always important. And uh, my father, he played piano and organ in a lot of churches down there. Okay. And continued to do so when he moved up here to get his doctorate in uh in uh, uh, biology. Wow. Okay. So he moved up here mainly for, for to get his master's. And, you know, I have three older sisters and my mom, they all came up here. I was, I mean, I, I, I was an oops baby, but because, <laughs> um, I mean, there's eight years between me and the, the youngest of my older sisters. And my dad had, prophesied amen to my mom <laughs> that they were going to have four children uh and you know when it didn't happen like straight away they stopped looking for me mm. but uh, i had to uh you know come through and hey uh you know i, I need a shot here right, let me get a shot at, at living <laughs> so i'm gonna be respectful so your dad was still active as you, as you said well I, I yeah he must have been <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I I call it accidental, but I mean, everybody in my family believes it was a, you know, it was, it was that's just how it was supposed to happen. All right. So you're the baby of the family. I'm the baby. I'm the only son. Okay. And uh, yeah, spoiled rotten, <laughs> uh, you know, and even as I got older and I, you know, I started working in the clubs and whatnot when I was in <laughs> probably 10th grade, like 16. Wow. Okay. And uh, so that meant a lot of late nights where I would get home sometimes at two thirty, three in the morning. And my my parents had enough uh, trust in the way I was brought up that they didn't think I'd be out there, you know, doing all sorts of things you're not supposed to be doing after ten or eleven o'clock. Mm-hmm. But um, but my sisters never had that same. I mean, my dad was like every other dad at that time, pretty much, you know, a, a, a male chauvinist. And didn't believe that he that his daughter should be out after ten o'clock anywhere. That's right. They're supposed to be home. <laughs> so you know, a lot of but it's old school boundaries, rules, right, and whatnot. Right. But because I was the only son, and I you know I was working for, I was actually making like money, folding kind at sixteen. <laughs> you know, they just gave me the latitude to do so. And my sisters, I would have to believe, were very jealous of that. 
Now, how did you, so when did you start playing? I mean, what got you into drums? Uh, what got me into drums was I, one of the neighbors uh, was, was a drummer, and I didn't know it. But one day this band started rehearsing in a, in a basement across the back alley from me. And um, I just, you know, it was the 70s. So I just, <laughs> I just wandered in the backyard. I was like following the sound. You know, to this you know, like window, the storm window where you could see downstairs in the basement. And ironically, the drummer was set up right there. So I'd hear them start playing and I'd, you know, go over in that, go over in their yard and be looking at how the dude was doing everything. And one time, uh, somebody came out the house and kind of just caught me standing there and was like, well, you want to come in? And so I went in there and, you know, met these dudes and sat behind the drums a little bit and looked around and, I, it just furthered my fascination. And uh, I start whooping the garbage cans in the back alley and whatnot, you know, making all sorts of noise. And uh, my dad was paying attention. I didn't think he was. And he got me a drum set. And uh, the condition upon uh, where, where I could keep it was if I was willing to take lessons. Okay. So uh, we looked for, uh, a, you know, a, 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 a well-respected teacher. And... Uh, his name is Floyd Thompson. He's still living. Mm. And uh, I refer any drummers that come at me, any young drummers that come at me here in town, I always aim them in his direction. So, um, okay. Mr. I, Thompson. I think that, well, yeah, Floyd Thompson. Yes. Floyd Thompson. Okay. Now, how uh, old were you when you got your drums in? Nine. Wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And within a, a couple of years, my dad was like, well, you might as well come on and play at the church. So, it would be me and him. He'd be playing the organ. I'd be playing the drums. And we started out at, you know, uh, Rock of Ages Missionary Baptist Church. Amen. Over amen. in St. Paul. Amen. But, um, well. you know, at that time, this was like 1978 or so, you know. So at that time, it was a little progressive to have that happen. And mm. um, some of the, you know, some of the 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 maybe it was the deacons or the pastor, the associate pastor. Somebody had a problem. So my dad was like, okay, no problem. And we rolled out and went over to the, the Kojic church, <laughs> you know, up the block and down the street. So they were happy to see us. So, you know. Okay. Wow. Like everybody ain't ready for, for what you want to give them. You know? So it was a father and son combination. Y'all was playing together. Like, that's, mm -hmm. that's dope, man. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And uh, so my very early uh, training was all about like what, what are you doing? What are you, why are you making all that noise? Give me the time. You know, play, you know, play some pocket. Leave some room for, for other people to say something. You know, and and he was right about all of it. Mm. And uh, I, I I still play according to those same tenets that I learned when I was eleven years old playing over at First Trinity Church of God in Christ, which I did all all the way up until I got the job with Prince. Actually, oh wow, yeah. Okay, so let me. So you are in this area now. I'm. So at this time, you're talking. You say it was like '78 or so. Something uh, like that. I was nine. around there. Okay, so at this point, you were obviously very young. Had did you have any uh, ink, uh, recollection, or did you aware that a, a Prince or some of these other bands existed uh, in your um, hometown? I, you know, I was. Oh, I didn't really understand. I had heard about him because like Channel 9 had done a news story on him, especially when he got got his record deal with Warner Brothers, which was probably 77, mm -hmm. something like that. So I had seen pictures of him on television and my mom said, oh, there goes that boy with the afro. I, I seen him on the on the bus stop the other day. <laughs> like my mom had seen him, you know, and it wasn't long before certain friends of mine were coming over with his records and kind of, have you heard this? You know, so on and so forth. And uh, I didn't take to it right away. Um, it, 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 um, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm making a decision right now, Michael Dean, to say something. <laughs> that, um, oh, wow, I don't know where this is going to go after I say this. But my immediate reaction was that, that, that I felt there was a dark energy mm. connected. Mm. Well, Why do you think that? I just, I, not even, uh, I, I didn't even think it. I'm just saying I reacted, which means I felt it in inside. 
Do you think that has anything to do with you having an early sort of uh, relationship in the church? To could be, mm-hmm. could be. But, um, you know, one thing I like to say often to people is that you can be persuaded to think certain ways or like your viewpoint can be augmented or, or challenged, but your experience is just what it is. Okay. Like you can't, you can't, you can't talk someone out of what they've experienced for themselves. Right. You know, you may be able to change their mind about something, but what you feel, you feel and what you know, you know. So you saying from your early, earliest times of being just aware of him, you sort of felt that, that kind of feeling. That's interesting. Okay. I tell you what, I, I'm remembering now exactly the point. Well, I mean, you, it's, I mean, we know who we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about one of the most lascivious artists of all time. <laughs> So, I mean, and, and I'm not even judging it. What I'm saying is th- that's simply what it is. Gotcha. You know? um, clearly, I mean, had it been a, you know, a, a harsh judgment on my part, I would have never taken the job. But what I'm saying is that I, I got acquainted. I guess I'm skipping that and going to the constructive part because I'm not trying to get. Uh, you know, I, no, we, listen, you're not saying nothing. Listen, a lot of us uh, ain't never heard before. Let, I mean, me, you let me just say this. Let me just say this. Sure. That poster in the controversy album. Yes. Where he's in the shower or something with a, with a cross on the wall. Right. I think that's what I saw that gave me the bad shift. Okay. Mm, okay. And, uh, you know, the way the mind works is through prolonged exposure. We accept things that we're not necessarily supposed to. Mm. Again, I'm saying all this, uh, I'm being completely referential. I am not speaking to anybody's particular experience. I'm not calling Prince evil. What I'm saying is it went the way it went. And that was my impression. Now, as I uh, got more acquainted, as he, you know, as he, he blew up, um, I was privy to where he was headed. I mean, I, there was always news or public interest stories about him. And uh, I do remember, like, in 1982, I think it was, the, it must have been the 1999 tour. The, uh, <clears throat> maybe that was the triple threat. Uh, I, they were supposed to play at the Met Center, and the city council or somebody had a problem with Prince doing that. So, <laughs> really? they, yeah, they, they wanted to cancel his show. And Prince had the, uh, the wisdom to make it, like, uh, an event for the food shelter, for the food shelves, rather. Uh, okay, okay. And then they got off his back about it. But I remember thinking that was that the fact that they were trying to um, to hold him back in that way. I, I, my first minute, my initial reaction was, it's probably on some kind of racist tip because Minnesota is, you know, one of the most racist states in the union. Was and is. Wow. See, so they leave that story out of the. Uh... Uh-huh. of the narrative these days. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I, time, went, time went on and more of my friends were into his music, so I heard it more often all the time. And I think the, the turning point for me where I decided that there was something valuable to be ventured was probably um, I went to a friend's house and he had the soundtrack to Under the Cherry Moon, Parade. Mm-hmm. And the, I found the music to be so imaginative and... Uh, it was really where he, it was part of when he was working with Claire Fisher, the, the, the string arranger. And, uh, and the guy who did all the string work on the family record and all that. Right. He, at that, the mixing that, the funk with all that, like all that wide harmony come, going on with this orchestration. Like I'd never heard anything like that before. I thought it was incredible. So from there, I kind of went, you know, retroactively back a little bit. Like I probably went back, I got, I remember buying a cassette in 1999 and, uh, or actually I even remember buying the CD and they weren't long enough to have uh, DMSR on. Right. And I was mad about that. (laughs) Um, anyway, things went the way they went. I got to meet him. I didn't get any weird impression about him. He talked to me like a regular person and, uh, you know, we, we got to know each other and, um, you know, the rest you know, I don't re- really need to go go well, over. Well, yeah, back <laughs> up. So, when you met him, what time was this? Oh, this would have been in 1988. Oh, okay. Or, uh, no, actually, I think 
Yeah, I think it must have been 1988. He started coming out to see Dr. Mambo's Combo, which is the band mm-hmm. that uh, that I've been playing with on and off for the last like 32 years. I started with that band when I was 17. I met Prince when I was 19. How, how did you and, get into that band? If we back it up just a little bit, like uh, Bobby Vandell, uh, also well-known Minnesota drummer. He played with uh, Alexander O'Neill. He played with a, uh, with a lot of folks. And um, Bobby uh, had to go to Los Angeles. or he, I think he was going to L.A. And from there, he was going on a tour. He was going to be out of town for like two months. And he was at a contest that I was in in 1986 called Twin Cities Best Drummer. And I, I happened to win it. I, I won first place. And he came up t- telling me about you need to come down to Bunkers, you know, come sit in with the combo. He didn't realize I was 16 at the time. <laughs> and, uh, I, and I told him, I'm not old enough to get into any places like that. You just come down, man. Yeah, and also, <laughs> you need to come down to the Whiskey Junction. I play down there with Doug Maynard. And he just, all these people who were uh, um, really uh, pinnacles of the musical community here. I got introduced to almost everybody. Right, right away. Wow. So um, Bobby went out of town, and I covered a, a, a lot of his gigs for him. And um, Dr. Mambo's Combo was one of them. And when he came back off the road, uh, they had decided that they, they wanted me to take over. Oh, whoa. So how did he take that? I mean, how, how, would, you, how would anybody take it? I mean, it's, that's not, nobody wants that. So you got this little gig, go take my gig. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I imagine that's how it went. He and I have never really discussed it a whole lot. Interesting. But he did, I, we got into an altercation some years ago where he's like, you have to understand where I'm coming from, man. I'm, I'm running this town and you come along. And, oh. you know. <laughs> he was on like, his days like this. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> you know, oh. I, I, it's like, I, hey, look, at least he was mad enough to just go ahead and say it. And he's actually a, a guy who really shaped my my um this attitude about being in this business because he's really the type of person who doesn't take anything from anybody he mm. believes in doing business clean and uh <laughs> somebody told me somebody who was singing one of his bands uh he's very, when he's a band leader he's very strict about time you better get on the stage and do what you came here to do mm. and uh somebody was looking for somebody and bobby was behind the drums they were waiting for him and uh Somebody said, um, does anybody know where so-and-so is? And Bobby looked up and said, I don't know where he is, but I know where he ain't. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's really him in a nutshell. I love him to death. <laughs> Hilarious. Okay. Um, I, was, well, I wanted to ask go back and ask you, though, um, in terms of your dad, uh, was there some, how was the transition from playing in the church? To playing out in these clubs, like, did, was he in support of that, or did he want you to go to school, or how, how did all that? I think happen? all the way up until Prince actually called the house and was like, "Might I speak to Michael, please." <laughs> I think all the way up until then, my dad was. Uh, my dad was also an educator. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that he worked in the St. Paul school system for many years. Like, uh-huh. he worked past like regular retirement age because the school didn't want to let him go. He was a, a, a strong educator, developed the science magnet program in St. Paul, Minnesota, him mm-hmm. and, a, and a colleague of his. Um, and uh, so, yeah, education was real important. Mm-hmm. And to him in, in my teenage years, it's like he could see that my fascination with music was only growing. And he tried to be a responsible parent and say, listen, the odds of you actually having a job in this business are slim and not. Like it's it's like being an athlete. Like you can, a lot of people want it, but oh, there's a very few select people who actually get it. You know, you need to have something to fall back on. You need to go to college, and you know, be qualified to do something else because you don't know where this is going. Mm-hmm. And I I I, it, I used to think it was the the hubris that comes with being young that makes you say, I don't need no backup plan. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to, you know, mm-hmm. but I mean, it, that's, it's actually a lot more real than that because you can't really accomplish anything in the creative arts unless you put your entire self into it. Mm-hmm. If you don't believe in it yourself, nobody else is coming along. 
you got to really invest yourself. And um, so he was right, but but I knew what I was feeling, and I knew that nothing was going to deter me. One way or another, I was determined to be the best I could be at, at what I was doing, and I was I was going to figure it out. And, uh, you know, all the way up until then, it was like, you just, you know, doing what feels good, don't put money in the bank. <laughs> you can't just, you know, I mean, you know, okay. uh, pragmatic, you know, pragmatic points and, uh, you know, and viewpoints. So I couldn't argue with him, but I needed proof. I needed evidence. And who would know it came in the form of Prince Rogers Nelson. <laughs> and you were living at home at this time? At your yeah, I met, uh, yeah, I was 18, 19. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you under- uh, where, was I gonna, where was I going to be at? No, I mean, he was at all, I was I went to Augsburg, actually. I went to Augsburg Lutheran College for a couple of years. Oh, okay. And when Prince actually did call me and offer me the job, I was so naive and, and uh, 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 unaffected, kind of. That I asked myself, well, do you think I'll have time to um, to finish my first semester next year? And he just started laughing. <laughs> he said, I don't think you're going to have time for that. <laughs> so it's, it's really funny the relationship he and I had early on because many times he could have just uh, just been like, do you know who you're talking to? Right, do you, right. You know, do you not understand the magnitude of what's happening around you? And I met, asked many, you know, what I call stupid questions and the patience <laughs> that he had with me because he knew I hadn't been nowhere and done nothing. Mm. You know, I would ask him, like, hey, what time is that flight tomorrow? You know, and, and this is I didn't know. He, I, it took me a, a little bit to realize. He don't think he doesn't think about any of that. And like he was like, he might not even be on the same flight as me. Mm-hmm. I just didn't know any better. I'm asking him and he looked at me like. What? <laughs> but, but he just all he said was was um I, I you know what I don't know you should probably ask Therese at, to ask his receptionist she had all the details like many times he pulled punches I never got to thank him for that because I was ignorant right. and uh, he never went out of his way with me in those early years to either belittle me or put me in my place you know. I mean, but all that comes with familiarity, just like right. people speak more open to you the longer they're around you. So, so you were, <laughs> once we get into the Prince thing, he's not going back. So just before we get into that, the, um, just trying to understand the context, because again, I as an use- outsider looking at Minneapolis during this time, obviously this is after Purple Rain, you superstar. Uh, also, let's be clear, you know, this is the era of the 80s. You know, there's titans out here, you know, Michael Jackson, Madonna, blah, 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 blah. Um, so there's two things. With that in mind, and you live in that environment, was the the cloud of Prince influence really heavy to you guys there? Or was or were you just like, yeah, I know it exists, but I'm not into that now or something? I don't know. It, it didn't really click for me uh, and who I was dealing with because I hadn't even seen Prince live. I um, a, My friend Bobby Zaragoza was trying to get his dad's station wagon to go see the Love Sexy uh, show when it was in town. Mm-hmm. And we thought we were going. And then at the last minute, his dad was like, nope, you can't have the car. So that was the one chance I had to go see Prince live for myself. Mm. And... um. So I, I didn't really know what he was capable of or not. There would be dudes in high school going, you know, Prince slows the tape down to tape him guitar solos, right? You know, he can't play. <laughs> you know, I'm saying this is this is the reality. Like, you know, like haters, you know. And um, uh, so I didn't know what to think. And we were in uh, rehearsal to play the Saturday Night Live yes. 15 year anniversary. We played was, that your, was that your first professional? I mean, your first gig with him? A big gig like that? Was uh, that the- yeah, it was the first gig. That was the first thing that happened in public. The first thing okay. I did with him, uh, like on a scale that anybody could know about, would have been the Party Man video. Oh, okay. Oh, that was yeah. Before. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Party Man was, was the one that set it off. Oh, hell, the Party and then Man. This, yeah. And then this was. Uh, this was a few months later. So you had, that's what I wanted to ask you. I wrote this down. The Saturday Night Live performance. Uh, I don't want you, if you can ask, speak on this. So that band, it was you, Levi, uh, Miko, uh, Patrice Russian, right? 
yes. sister. Mm-hmm. And it was it Margie Cox? Yeah, and, Margaret. And, mm-hmm. oh, and, and, and then Candy. Candy Dolphin. Yes. Uh-huh. Was that supposed to be like a band to do other stuff? Or do you know? Or? I think it was this sort of transitional space he was in. Okay. Like the Love Sexy Tour ended and he was going through a rebuilding phase. And I know he he had been clamoring. He'd been talking to Eric Leeds in Atlanta Bliss about bringing Candy in when they were in the band. Mm. And, you know, I mean, I guess that Eric, Eric Eric will tell you himself. He, he told Princeton, if you want a woman to play horn, we know many that can, that can play better than her. Oh. <laughs> but Candy was the... What am I... Am I talking out of You ain't talking about no, 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 Not no, to no, me, no. you ain't. Not at all. Not at all. Right. <laughs> hey, this is not... I'm not slagging on Candy. I no, think she no. plays great. No, no, I no, think no, she's no, incredible. No. She's a, And on top of that, she's a nice person. And her mom is pure gold. I don't know if you've spoken to any of these people there, but there, she's cool. I got no beef with what she did or what she's doing. I think she's great. Yeah, big, big sexy's in love with her. That's why he said that. He, he, As well, you know he's what? just caping. That's all. And, 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 and I understand. <laughs> and what's even funnier is I, I, I feel, I feel, uh, um, I feel that actually, I mean, Candy. Yeah, sure. She's she, she's a, a, a nice person. She's she looks great. But uh, it's funny when I met her mom. It was like part of me like sprung out. <laughs> <laughs> mom came, are fine too. Huh? They came through bunkers, and I start talking to her mom, and some kind of this thing kind of came over me, like, oh, Candy's mom, man. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. hilarious. I, I'm just yeah. <laughs> we're just talking, man. <laughs> but but let's go, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so you know they were if they were going to work with a horn player, they wanted somebody who understood things the way they do them, and that's that's fair. Mm-hmm. They didn't want a a learning cor- curve or to have to train somebody to do anything. And I think Prince was trying to encourage them to do that because mm-hmm. she she never left his mind or his plans, you know. And I think not until really like through we got through like the graffiti bridge. Uh, recording sessions and you know she was a young girl man she was missing she was missing home she was seeing a guy back home and she was you know in in minnesota in the dead of winter in the middle of nowhere Hmm. so i mean it just it it wore on her i'm sure and um she decided she wanted to go back home so that's what she did but she didn't give up she just found a a different way Mm -hmm. What, what was it like rehearsing with that band that crew oh man that band was incredible uh, I mean, Margaret, Margaret, Margie Cox, as they call her, she's Tamara from Tamara and the Scene. Yeah, yeah. Jesse, A and M, uh, and she's also uh, the female lead singer in Doctor Mambo's Combo. So Prince was kind of going down there looking for her, and she ended up. They actually he he met her at a different club at the Fine Line. The Combo was playing Wednesdays at the Fine Line. Um, uh, as well as bunkers on Mondays, and mm. I had a different gig on Wednesdays at a different club, so I couldn't do it. So another notable and brilliant and incredible drummer from Minneapolis uh, was doing those nights. I wasn't there. It was Gordy Gordy Knudsen, and Gordy is uh, he's he's a giant to me. Okay, and he also took lessons from Floyd Thompson. So it, I don't know if it's there's a thing where hmm. Floyd taught us all kind of the same sort of, you know, way to do it. And then we kind of took our, you know, put our own selves into it after. But, I mean, it's, uh, anyway, let me just cut to the chase. <laughs> Prince invites her into the limo on a break, and they start talking. He's like, well, what are you doing? Are you still working with Jesse? So on and so forth. Oh, no, no. Blah, 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 blah. The, the, and uh, <laughs> she's, he's like, you guys got a pretty good band. And she tells him, oh. You should see this kid that plays with us every Monday. So Margaret was the one to tell Prince about me. Oh, and she was like, oh, Prince came down on Wednesday. I was like, really? So I was kind of mad about it. She said, oh, I told him about you. I was like, oh, okay, great. I didn't think no more about it till he comes walking in the club like two weeks later. And uh, I mean, it was, he came the first time and the next time it was like, Levi and Miko, like all all these dudes showing up <laughs> in full gear. You know what I mean? Like showing up, 
like in like those clothes from the love sexy period almost right you know and uh so it's just kind of evolved from there he sat in and you know i just didn't look at him and the sound guy was like, Prince, he, like, he never took his eyes off your hands, man. I think this is going somewhere. I think you're going to get a job. I'm like, get out of my face, man. <laughs> you know, he's just, he's, first off, he's down here because of Margaret. You know, I didn't know anything. He's down here. He's, I think he's trying to do something with Margaret. He ain't thinking about me. And then it progressed to being like, hey, um, so like people call it down to the club or like security showing up, either Dwayne or Gilbert. Showed up at the at, at bunkers, going, "Hey, Prince wants to know if you guys can come out to, to Paisley tonight after you finish." Mm. There's a lot of that, and so you know, like I heard the Batman record before it came out. Like Billy and Billy Franzi, who's a guitar player, and Margaret and I uh, carpooled to Paisley one night after the gig, and the, the engineer opened the front door, of Paisley Park, invited us in, asked if we if we wanted anything to drink or anything. And played the Batman record from start to finish in Studio A. He wanted to know what we thought about it, and so so on and so forth. I mean, he probably really just wanted to show off, but <laughs> <laughs> what, you know. What, but what did you think about it? I'm just curious. <laughs> oh, I, man, I, to this day, it's one of my favorites. But I know a lot of people who don't like it. Mm. But um, I, so I, I mean, right away I was into it. I had, I mean, Bat Dance was already out, and okay. I was like. Only Prince can do something this twisted and have it turn into, into a number one song. <laughs> that that song is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you mentioned this earlier, but going in the in the order what you're saying now, what was that? Did, did Prince call your house or have to speak to your parents or something? You said he. Yeah, he literally called. This was before before we shot the Party Man video. It was during the summer. Mm -hmm. And I was out of school for the summer and just got to do my thing anyway. He had been coming around and we'd been going back and forth for a little bit before he like made an official, uh, you know, a, a serious declaration. Once before then, um, we went out to Paisley after Planet Bunkers to attend a party he was having for, uh, for Bon Jovi. They were in town playing at like the Civic Center or somewhere. Mm -hmm. And Prince invited us out after to, to kind of jam and living color was opening for them on that tour. So I was like, yeah, I want to go. So we went out there and he kind of kicked them off the, off the stage and brought us up <laughs> and we started jamming on, uh, what is it? I think it's game and on you, uh, by, uh, P funk. Yeah. Um, everybody funking, but don't know how you should have seen the bull when he funked the cow. That one. <laughs> funk so hard they the, the what the sauce of smoke uh, let, let's let's get into bed and funk like folks like that, that whatever song that is is what we were jamming on and Prince just leaned over to the microphone at one point and said hey son you looking for a job <laughs> but he was looking at me wow. and I was like oh yeah right ah, ha, 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 ha. you know I still didn't take any of it serious you know so it took him actually calling the house and my dad answered the phone but I had so many people calling about work that my dad started answering the phone uh Mike Bland's house. <laughs> like he just pick up the phone and say that, no matter who was on the other end. <laughs> Mike Bland's house. And one time he did that, and Prince, may I speak to Michael, please? <laughs> and he handed me the phone, and that was it. I never heard anything more about, you need to have something to fall back on. You need to have mm -hmm. a plan in case this don't go right. So that was a, a vindicating moment for me. Wow. How did your family feel about that? Just like, he about to play with Prince. You, you, you're doing it. You know, I don't really remember because there's mm -hmm. such a uh, uh, age differential between me and the other siblings. A lot of what, ex what I experienced, I experienced on my own without anybody to really share it with. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to explain. It's like, you know, there's six of us, but uh, it's not. We, we're not the type of family where people get into each other's business all the way. You got know? It, got it. <laughs> and plus, I was the only working musician in the family. I was the only one who did it for a living. Everybody else did it if they did it, you know, to either to to serve the church or, you know, like it was not, it was a secondary thing mm -hmm. for my youngest sister and my and my father who played, uh, my sister still, my, my young, Carla still plays in the church. Okay. Uh, but my dad passed away uh, several years ago from Alzheimer's. Oh, man. Sorry but, uh, to hear that, man. That, well, thanks. I mean, it's, yeah. yeah. But uh, so, it, you know, there was nobody really to, 
that who could relate? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just this thing I was doing. I mean, and it's funny because once I got out on the new tour, I think it was like two months before I called home. Like, I, it just, I didn't even think about it. I was so inundated in what was happening. You know, but I was 19, 20 years old, uh, you know, traveling across Europe with a bunch of people. My, my people didn't know, you know. And this was your, it, was this your first time traveling overseas as well? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. But it was just like, well, finally, my dad was like, well, we've been watching the news to see if there's any, you know, <laughs> any, any plane accidents or anything. Jesus. You know, you could have <laughs> called. You know, I'm just like, <laughs> but I'm like, you have no idea what I've been you know, involved in. It's hard to explain. If you haven't done it, it's hard to get people to relate. So going on the road, new tour, you, you, you're the newest drummer. You, you, uh, Sheila E was before you, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Getting what was, so what was it for you? This is all new, like the pacing of it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that, that, that staying up late, got to get up early to leave for the next place and all that kind of stuff. I mean, was that, were you able to keep up with that or was it a, you know, did you have to learn sort of your pacing of that whole thing? No. Um, one thing that I, I'm good at is following instructions and, <laughs> and, and listening intently. And I don't ever want to be, I don't want to be the last one there. I don't want people waiting on me and I don't like waiting on people. So, mm. I, it's always been sort of my attitude. I like to be punctual, even now. You know, I don't like my time wasted. And I don't like making the same mistakes twice. So I've sort of been this fastidious sort of, you know, uh, type of person my whole life. I, I don't, I, I don't want, I want things to go as they're, like they're supposed to. So if I was ever in doubt, I just did what Mika and Levi did. I just watched where they went. Mm. And what what they did, that's I mean it's kind of like being in the army. And some didn't somebody say in a movie like, well, how did you know it was time to? How did you know where the mess hall was at? I, oh, it was a few good men. The dude said, well, I just followed the crowd. You know, when it was time for lunch. <laughs> so that's kind of was my mo. I just went literally with what I could glean from them in in, in the situation. Like Kim Basinger coming around, you know, um, after that party man video shoot, she was she was coming around Paisley quite a bit. And um, I noticed, like, they didn't speak to her first. And, and if they responded to her, it was short. <laughs> and they didn't really make any kind of eye contact or anything. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I guess that's what we're doing. So I'm, I'm walking around, like, I'm going to, the, to one of the bathrooms on the, on the main level. We're out there recording one night, and she's there. And I turned the corner from the uh, stairwell. And and we almost run into each other, and I'm like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. And she's like, oh, wow. no, no, no I'm, I know you guys are used to people creeping around here at the you know at this time of night, uh, and uh, you know I was I was petrified, <laughs> I was terrified. She's like, oh, I've been meaning to say tell you, I think you're, you're you're an incredible drummer, and really for somebody so young, she's talking. I'm just like, I need to get away from this woman because I I don't want no trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you say this one woman is going to trip me up, man. You better not eyeball that exactly. one. Well, oh, hey, listen, Emmett Till is real. <laughs> oh, Lord. Remember Emmett. <laughs> Was it like that in Pasty Park? Like, no, no, no. Uh, but I'm saying, if you're young and you don't know everything you need to know about your environment, a smart person will just, you know. Right. Maintain an, an observant an observatory role, you know, because I I mean I'm the youngest and I'm the last one hired. You can be the first one fired. That's right. So <laughs> I did. I just you know I wanted to if I was leaving I wanted it to be on my own terms. I didn't want to be behind something stupid. Right, man. So, so did you play on now? See, so you you brought Kim Basinger. Uh, I have heard there's like recordings of s stuff that she did. You play on any of those songs that uh, Kim Basinger that, that she was on? No, yeah. but I do okay. know that um that she did do some recording with Prince out there. The mm -hmm. first time I heard her singing was actually on uh a version of a song called Soul Psychedella Side. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think he had tried a couple different women singing these parts, 
there was a, a, a woman from around here named Jaina, Jaina Anderson. And hmm. I think she may have tried singing it first, and then he tried the Kim Bay singer singing it. I don't know if the song ever came out official, and if there's a bootleg out there, I don't know who's on it. But, um, okay. but yeah, she fancied herself to be a, a, a she she sings. She's I don't know if she's a singer, but she sings. I, I know I saw some footage of her singing with um, the B-52s, because I think she's also from huh. Athens, Georgia. Interesting. Oh, she's friends with them. I think she got on stage with like a beehive, you know, wig on yeah. and like kind of singing with them one time. I think I saw something like that. But she was delightful, man. We uh, I'll tell you a, a very rare story right now. Um, Bradford Marcellus was playing at uh, the Fine Line. That's a club in Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. And um, I was there to check it out. And... Um, Prince and Kim Basinger came in and they went into the, up to the to the uh, to the upper mezzanine and and took a table and I was already up there but I wasn't going to go over there saying anything to anybody but um I I think Dwayne Prince's brother saw me over there and he leaned over to Prince and Prince looked up and then Dwayne came over and said and Prince said if you want to sit at his table you know it's perfectly fine man if you want to come over said, okay so I did and. Uh, I think um, they may have had a few like pre gig cocktails, <laughs> pre fun. <laughs> uh, but they had a, that, like they. I think they might have had some champagne on the way either the, on the way down, or maybe at Paisley before they came down to the show, because they they're a little giggly. <laughs> and uh, Prince reached over to grab something, and he knocked her champagne, knocked her glass over, and it all ran right into her into her lap, and. Prince was so, so mortified. His eyes got all big. Oh, I'm saying he jumped up all quick. And she was like, hey, it's no big deal. She was, she didn't care about it at all. I could see he was a little bit embarrassed. And plus, I'm sitting there like, whoa. <laughs> Prince just knocked something over in this woman's lap. It's, it's, it's hard to find, to, to see Prince kind of out of his element, like taking out uh, of okay. himself like right. that. Right, right. You know, he's a very cool customer, you know. So that was a, a rare you know, moment I had where I saw him l- a little unnerved and, you know, and, and uncool. <laughs> a little cracking the shield there. A little bit. And that was early on for me, too. So I was like, OK, well, all right. So um, going back to the, the, the new tour band and stuff. So you it's interesting. So you came in, you were new. Uh, was Rosie around before you came in or after? No, actually, that's what happened is that. Um, Patrice Russian, I'm not sure what she was, what her plans were, but I think that they actually offered her the tour. But I mean, the reality of that is, I'm Patrice Russian in 1989. Right. I'm I'm making a half a million dollars out of my own home studio. Uh, I'm I'm uh, doing arrangements for people. I'm scoring movies. I'm you know she didn't need the job is really what it was. Oh, oh boy! And on a sideline on that, I had the worst crush on her, man. Oh <laughs> man! And she just she played like a sensitive dude, but but she was just so sweet to be around, man. Oh my goodness, Patrice, <laughs> Patrice! <laughs> if you're out there, yeah. no. oh, listen, my wife is actually sitting on the couch listening I, to me. I, I hear her in stuff. the background. I hear yeah. a young lady back there. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, I'm just, it's, it's public common knowledge I don't hide I don't, I don't hide many things from my wife and you should not no. exactly <laughs> should that's not. right and somehow they find out anyway yeah <laughs> so uh so you say they, they offered it to Patrice but then that so then Rosie came after that well yeah the right. ideal person would have been somebody to take over where Bonnie left off Bonnie boy yeah that's right so um and well, I was gonna ask you this too. So, mm-hmm. because also you have the introduction of, um, I guess, the Game Boys or Tony and, right. and Kirk and those guys. So there's all these new elements. That, uh, Not that really though, because if you okay. look in Purple Rain, you see Tony David and Kirk up there. <gasps> well, for sure. Oh, no, 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 no. They're up there doing doing their steps. They were always, we were always. There's always people. Uh, what's sort the word I'm looking for? Got <laughs> percolating and simmering in the background. Right, right, right. Like everybody in Minneapolis is waiting to try to get their shot. Okay. And uh, I mean, famously, I think somebody asked those three dudes, like, 
So how did you meet Prince? And they're like, we met him in the First Avenue bathroom. Like they were in there working on some choreography and Prince came walking in to like, you know, use the latrine. That's how they met him. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they got put in the movie from there and they shot a lot more footage than made it into the film. But I mean, so these were also Kirk Johnson. Kirk Johnson grew up with Prince and Sonny in there. Mm-hmm. You know, he played uh, uh, when he was eight, like eight years old. He played like uh, bongos, the Congos and, and Sonny's band, the family. Yeah, so, no, I'm, I'm saying in terms of them, you know, just in being the band together, you know. Oh, you know, I, you know it was that was really a, a turning point. I remember us meeting without any of them present, and Prince saying, "Like, what do you guys think? Like, should we take the the, the show to this kind of situation? It's like a lot of people got backup dancers now. You know, it's not something I ever really did, but maybe it's time to do something different." And Levi was a very big fan of. Uh, modern black culture, hip hop, anything, you know, mm-hmm. out, anything that was new, he knew about it. Okay. And so he always had a constructive opinion about everything uh, like related to that. And he was like, I think we should do it. I think, I, I, you know, I think they're bad. I think it, it, it can only make the show more hype. So uh, the Prince decided to hire them to go ahead and do it. Nice. Okay. <clears throat> and and then they just, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Then they, they became a part of that band, which, as you well know, changed again before Diamonds and Pearls came out. So, I mean, th- through uh, after that tour, began work on on Diamonds and Pearls. Like we got off the road and came right back to Paisley and started working on things. Um. So by uh. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to think, man. It's it's hard because it was a, it was a lot of people coming and going, <laughs> right? And and also uh, just a lot. I mean, it's just been a while. <laughs> What's um? So I, I remember like the thing interesting about that tour to me because it came uh, after Batman, but also either just before Graffiti Bridge had came out. I believe, like, were you working on any of the Graffiti Bridge stuff, too, or was that already done when you came into the picture? Not really. Um, the majority of my recording was with Prince. It was just him and me a lot of the time. Um, there's a record that Elisa Fiorello, uh, Deese, I think is her last name now, um, did in, in, like, came out with in, like, 89, maybe, uh, called I Am. And um, two tracks I played on. Uh, Love's No Fun. And the other one's called, uh, it's called Ooh, This I Need. Okay. And um, both of those. Prince just sat at the piano. And I was at the drums behind, um, you know, some partition glass, some partition, you know, doors and mm-hmm. whatnot. And um, it was just him and I. And then... I, I, you know, he's like, well, you want to hang out? Well, yeah. So then he moves to the control room and he starts overdubbing. Starts putting bass down. He starts putting other keyboards down. You know, and in between, we're just talking. We're just getting to know each other, you know, just musically. Like, you know, where are you from? Not like geographically, but like what's, what influences you? You know, what, what have you been into? What are you, what are you listening to now? You know, so we always had a real... Because uh, he had eclectic taste like like I did. So every once in a while, we just end up talking about like the Pretenders or Dolly Parton <laughs> or, you know, Gary Newman, like all these different artists that a lot of black folks just didn't really, you know, take to. But when you're Midwestern black and you're a musician, you, I mean, you eat what you're served and mm-hmm. a lot of rock and roll up this way, you know? Okay. Okay. But that's why they were, they were always a little wilder than everybody else, you know? <laughs> What um so you 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 talked about uh, you mentioned the diamonds and pearls so what were those sessions like because at that time the sound it's it sounded more like a band recording of these songs was it actually a band on a lot of these songs or yes I, okay. that's how Prince preferred to record most of that music um I think that he just found a band that. I think that was the point in time where he decided that he was going to work with, and I'm not saying this as a slight to anybody else that came before or after, but I feel like that was a mature decision on Prince's part because once he found musicians who could work together in a certain kind of way and also um, 
uh, help him to manifest his ideas so quickly. Hmm. Um, Because, I mean, I think it was Jimmy Jam said it. He said that uh, somebody asked Jimmy Jam how come it took so long for uh, Prince to hire Sonny. And I, I heard that what he said was, you have to understand that having your mentor in your band is something you have to be psychologically prepared for. And Sonny, Sonny is, is Sonny is all. Sonny is everything. Interesting. You have to be psychologically prepared to have your mentor in the band. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. That's pretty and interesting. So, yeah. And all of those dudes looked up to Sonny. Mm-hmm. And Sonny was so really supposed to be the first one to touch the golden chalice. He, it just didn't work out that way. Mm. But he never forgot him. He, it was just the right time to no, put him he, in. He, none of those dudes forgot Sonny. You know, I, I mean, I don't know what they may have done to <clears throat> make his the, his 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 life any easier. You know, I don't know what what anybody may have done to say, "Hey, listen, man, thank you for this." Right. You know, but they certainly, in my opinion. They, they all should. Sonny, Sonny pointed the pointed in the direction for a lot of these cats around here. You know, like mm-hmm. they, the, he was the 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 mark to aim for. That's so, the truth. Yeah, I mean, in um, Guitar Player Magazine, I remember they were asking Prince, "So who are your early influences?" You know, trying to get into it. Like, Did you listen to Jimi Hendrix much? And, Son- and Prince was like, "Not really." I mean. The, my main influence on guitar was the guy who plays bass in my band. <laughs> and they just didn't want to hear it. Right. They kept saying, they're like, well, we've heard you say things about uh, Carlos Santana before. And like, yes, I listened to Santana. He was an influence, but really, it was Sonny. Mm. Okay, like, yeah. Prince would tell me stories about Sonny all the time. He said, man, he said, Sonny, you, he said, Sonny used to walk into class. They were at, at North Central. He said, man, Sonny used to walk into class. He had a, a powder blue Stratocaster on his back <laughs> and, and an Apple hat to match. <laughs> and he would walk into class like that in the high school. <laughs> he was ready. <laughs> yeah. And I think Prince took that, you know, and got on a motorcycle with it and put his telly on his back in Purple Rain. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> now, that's just me. Why are you laughing, Big Sexy? You know, it's, just, it's great because I can picture that. <laughs> You know, you yeah. picture the, the strat mm-hmm. and you see Prince with the telly. And the thing is, for, for a guitar head, tellies, to me at least, are physically smaller than a strat anyway. So I can see that, you know, because Prince okay. wasn't a big guy. I can see that. Uh-huh. But um, uh, what's funny is one of the last guitars he owned, um, one of the last new guitars that he, he had was a powder blue strat with a, with a whammy bar. And he told me, he said, I call this with Sonny. I named it after Sonny. So any pictures you see of him playing that guitar, he got that guitar because of Sonic. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, they need to, they need to, they need, we need to hear more, uh, more Sonny stuff, man. I mean, just in general, because you hear about his influence, <clears throat> but you don't ever get to hear too much from him. You know, I think it's kind of, um, I, I, oddly enough, he doesn't like to speak socially too often. He doesn't, Sonny doesn't speak a lot, mm. you know? And also, you have to understand that um, the kind of grief Sonny experienced was different than the rest of ours from Prince Pass. This, okay. is a, a, this is a living, breathing person who he knew before the money. Right, got gotcha. you. Gotcha. I mean, Prince literally, like, uh, apparently, what, what the legend says is that Prince worked on his first serious demo when he was in that band. I think the band was called Champagne. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was him and a bunch of the other cats on, on the north side. And they were working on a demo, and it just, I guess by Prince's standards, it just wasn't good enough. And so he worked on another demo by himself. And apparently it was incredible. But the band was upset because it looked like a power play to them. Like, what you trying to do, man? Mm-hmm. You know. And so they ended up parting ways with him. And at that point, he decided he was going to try to get a record deal by himself. And um, he needed to raise money. To, to take a, a trip out to L.A. With, with his manager. And Sonny hired him to play guitar in his band and mm. paid him. So the money that Prince earned to take that trip to Los Angeles was, was money that Sonny paid him while he was, you know, 
during his residency as Sonny's guitar player. Well, I ain't never heard that before. That's <laughs> a, a lot that's of people won't, you know. Yeah, I mean, wow. Wow. it's just people don't know. They, you know, <laughs> that's what this is for, Michael yes, Anthony. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, <laughs> I'm a whole government. Yes, sir. <laughs> but, uh, man, I, shout out to Sonny T, man. That's that's yeah. right. Sonny yeah. is all. Sonny, he's the, he's the n- nicest person you ever want to meet. He's a it, like truly pure at heart. I mean, we're all messed up on many levels. <laughs> but if you get to know Sonny Thompson, uh, his heart is pure gold. He's a brilliant musician, and he's a free spirit, you know, if the world lets him be, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's all I really want to say. Okay. Um, so new tour, then you're going into Diamonds and Pearls. Um, <clears throat> what did you think of the band at this point? I don't actually ever ask anybody like you're in the band did you, did you like the band at that point uh yeah i mean listen getting to listen to rosie sing every day <laughs> are you kidding me man i mean we got to europe and the, the first gig i think was in rotterdam it might have been either the ahoy or it was this outdoor show and it was like sixty five thousand people and there were people all over with rosie sing sing rosie yeah rosie rosie they had signs all the way already for Rosie before she even got there. Wow. And she had only been on um, New Power Generation. We are the New Power Generation. She just, Prince just decided to like, let her put some icing on it. And that was all it took. They were ready for her when she got there. So, I mean, yeah, like every day, every rehearsal was like, um, like really, that was a, that was a unique group of, 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 of people that the music that was happening was so uh uh i don't know i don't know how to explain it's like we were so cohesive and there's so much soul coming out all the time mm-hmm. okay. you know so it was really a joy also i mean really because the ensemble was bigger i mean it was like nine people it was a lot harder to pull us together for no good reason and i mean that by like the smaller the band got the more the more we kind of had to be around because it was easy to call four people and say, get over here. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like you kind of still were able to have a life sort of because it was just a lot of people. Okay. And, you know, as the band dwindled down, you know, over the years, it just, we spent a lot more time at the building and it it became a bit more of a, I don't want to say like a claustrophobic experience, but it was, it came out, it became a lot more like, living at the compound. You know what I mean? Hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. For lack of a better way to even put it over. You, know? <laughs> um, you, you mentioned new power generation. Uh, recently they just released the 1999 uh, remaster box set thing. Did you, at the time when you did that song, new power generation, or, or you heard that, did you had heard that bold generation, what it is based off of? I haven't heard it yet. Oh, I still okay. haven't heard it. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm a, oh. uh, I'm slow, man. I'm slow on the no, I'm sure you're a busy man. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, yeah. Well, that, uh, cause, uh, have you heard about this, the, the, the song? Only what people. I've seen on Facebook about it. People, oh, okay. people talking about it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Well, a um, couple, so there's a couple t- touch points I wanted to ask me. I asked about this particular period. Um, okay. Uh, MTV. Let's, let's go. There. Let's go here. MTV Awards. Just uh, shout yeah, out. Right. Shout out to Lizzo. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the pants. You know that 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 classic performance. Were you aware, you personally, of what he was going to wear <laughs> at that time? Because you're sitting in the back. <laughs> so, so I'm like, God, he's like, God damn, what? I'll tell you what. We um. Did like we normally did. We went to his dressing room to pray before we went out on stage. And he he walked out of like another room into the room face front (laughs) and joined the prayer circle. And right after we finished praying, somebody poked their head in the room and said, they're ready for you. And he cut the he cut the the prayer circle, like walked through us. And that's when we saw. (laughs) 
<laughs> now, did you feel that evil or that sort of spirit? <laughs> I, I was like, what is, what? You know, I didn't say, nobody said nothing. We just all looked like, hmm, oh, okay. I mean, but comparatively, uh, Michael Anthony Dean, we were stepping, <laughs> we were stepping out on a stage with a bunch of, you know, right, basically that's... naked people in body stockings behind us doing yeah. God knows what. <laughs> So, I mean, <laughs> and you got to understand also, I, we didn't have, we were performing. We didn't like, like really have a chance to look around or think too much about any of it. All, all that was on my mind is don't mess up. Mm. Everything else was ancillary. If I happen to notice, great. But I'm telling you, my, my sense of professionalism w- w- never got swayed by, you know, like just sideline type stuff what's f- most important to me that is that the job is well done right. that's all i'm focused on doing i don't want nobody messing with my work especially me I, it's got to come across a, a, as good as possible and that's really what you know that's why i was such a strong employee for him because i wanted everything to be right just like him mm-hmm. and i'm not saying anybody else didn't but i'm saying i i think i may have been one of the only people who challenged his level of scrutiny when it came to how the music was being put down. Like sometimes mm. I want to take it over again. He's like, what for? I'm like, I just feel like it could be, no, go, get out of here. He <laughs> chased, chased me out the studio. I'm like, I got it. You, you're worse than I am, he said one time. <laughs> so I, we, we had that in common, the drive to, to get it right, you know? Well, and plus you're the drummer. Like, I mean, you're sort of the backbone That's right. of, of the performance, you know, the and, sound. And I, right. So I had to take you know, I had I had a, a, a special sense of accountability. Mm. Yeah. So, so oh, I just took back to that performance. So you obviously you guys had to rehearse. So all you had all those dancers and stuff. See, I mean, you knew what was that it was going to be on some other stuff. Like, well, I think we were supposed to. I think during camera blocking, they want you to do everything you're going to do. Right. The FCC don't want you. Dick Clark came out and said, "Hey, we need to see what's going on here." And um, I think somebody got like some sort of uh, some liquid was liquid was being poured on somebody, and he was, uh, mm-hmm. we need to know what that is. Is that water? Like they really they go through it, man. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we had to perform with the dancers in the clothes they were gonna gonna wear. Uh, at, it was like sound check the run through for the cameras. Mm-hmm. Like, right. Okay. So yeah, they knew what was gonna happen. We knew what was gonna happen. But I don't remember if Prince had the yellow jumpsuit on at soundcheck or not. He may have had it on, but maybe had an overcoat or something. Hmm. I don't remember, honestly. If, if he would have came up to you, say, he would say, uh, Michael, I need you to wear something on this performance. You, me and you're going to wear matching outfits. Would you have worn that? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I honestly, I, let me just say, I, I don't know. And, I, and I'll, let me... Actually, I, I, I had a strange experience. Well, I had many strange experiences with Prince, but one of those str- really most bizarre was uh, we got off the Act 2 tour. And it was I think it was the first time I saw him when we got back. And I walked into Studio B, and he had my tour clothes on. Mm-hmm. He had, like, like, he had gone upstairs to wardrobe, and somebody safety pinned one of my outfits so that he could wear it. <laughs> and he was walking around in the studio. And I walked in, I was like, he had everything but the hat on. <laughs> and he said, he looked at me and said, do you like it? He said, it's, <laughs> it's the latest in bland wear. <laughs> bland wear. I was like, yeah, okay, man, all right. You know, I just kind of <laughs> shined it on. But I'm like, what is he doing? <laughs> I guess he paid for it. He can wear whatever he wants. I, I guess. guess. So. But why my clothes? You know? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. What, oh, you know, some, I think some people asked this in the thing. What, what was the uh, inspiration for the hat, man? Like, who came up with that? I literally was shopping at, like, uh, I, while I was going to college, I was on the West Bank of the University uh, of Minnesota a lot. Um, and um, there was a store called Global Village. There's a, a couple of them, at least, in Minneapolis. Or, like, in Duluth, like, in the area. 
and they sell a lot of uh, strange uh, articles of clothing and like, you know, just like uh, real, uh, how do I explain exactly? Just like you can buy anything in there, like fertility gods and, <laughs> you know, uh, this is uh, it's what the ancient Mesopotamians, Mesopotamians would wear when they, you know, a lot of this crazy stuff in there. And I saw this this hat that didn't look particularly ethnic to me, but I was like, I, I kind of dig that. <laughs> so I bought this hat, and um, I I actually went to get my hair cut by somebody, and they were like, Oh wow, um, I saw your hat. You know, I make hats, and they made me a couple. And um, when Prince met me, I had one on, oh, and okay. he he, uh, he asked me said he he said I like that look, and he's like, Is that, is that your thing? I said, yeah, it's kind of what I'm doing right now, but you know, and it just kind of, you know, it's when when it came time to figure out what was going on with my look, it just kind of be, became a part of it. I remember Miko saying, "Man, I think that's funky. You look like uh, Jerome Braley from from Funkadelic." <laughs> uh, he said, "Man, he used to wear like 11 inch hats, man." And uh, so I stopped. Oh, okay. Well, if Miko likes it, it must be cool. So I just went with it. Yeah. Nice, nice. <clears throat> um, I'm trying to get everything from that era because they're gonna hit me, hate me. I know I'm forgetting <laughs> stuff, <laughs> but um, oh, and speaking of the so the look, uh, you you didn't you have like you used to be like bald, but then you had like the little perm. Was that you with the perm thing on the top? Probably, yeah. It looked like a little <laughs> like samurai type of vibe. <laughs> Yeah, I had been growing my hair underneath because I, I was getting sick of wearing the hats. And I got um, you. what happened was uh, T Bird, who was doing Prince's hair at the time, Tanya, um, she said, Ooh, let me relax that. <laughs> and so she she relaxed it and, you know, and styled it. Oh, my and God. I could have went out with the hat uh, that evening, uh, but um, she said, Oh, we need to show Prince. You know, and so mm. Prince was like, Yeah, I like it. Let, let's do it. So I was getting sick of trying to get in and out of the limos with the hat on. <laughs> and, you know, it's like if I, if I rock too hard, it might fall off my head. I didn't. I just was sick of the anxiety that came with wearing that hat. Gotcha. So. Um, another thing I wanted to know, too, like, <clears throat> so in terms of like when you guys were working on songs, uh, would Prince usually have like the basis of a song and then you guys would sort of contribute to that? Or how, what was some of the processes of how that worked? Oh, it could be it could be any way. Prince was not adverse to uh, taking any path to get it. Okay, you know, which which included, fortunately or unfortunately, you know, walking in on something that's happening before he gets there, and just kind of, yes, thank you very much. I'll take that. <laughs> what, what was one? Name us a song that something like that happened. The last one was thirty one twenty one. Oh, okay. Sonny and I were just getting tones for the engineer. And we was in there laughing to ourselves. Oh, man, this is fucking. And Prince came high stepping into the studio out of nowhere. What can we in? What's this? What's this? <laughs> you know, <laughs> he picked his guitar up and we, you know, we, we jammed it on for another couple of minutes. He's like, oh, stop. All right, let's rotate. And that was it. Me and Sonny looked at each other like we gave him another one. <laughs> <laughs> Now, would you like for me to go down the list of, of the ones that uh, have been uh, given, amen? Please do. I'll just give you a couple. Uh, 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 one was P Control. Really? And another one would be a song called Rip Hop Go to Zipper. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. The, that's me and Sonny looped in the background. Like, everything that's happening on those tracks is predicated on what we have to be, happen to be doing at that moment. Wow. Was there, so, wasn't there talk of you guys doing some sort of, uh, or maybe you did it. It was like a loop sample. We did thing? it. Uh -huh. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, we did it. And it, it, it sold well. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the company was a little, uh, uh, let me just, uh, yeah, suffice to say that <laughs> we don't really work with those people anymore. I got you. All right. Man. Okay. So you and Sonny was like, you know, was kind of linked up and, and grooving a lot, coming up with different things. I mean, it just, it didn't even have to come up with. It just was happening always. I mean, you know, it's like interrupting stream. Like you're thirsty and you see a running stream and you put your hand in there. 
and you you you're taken from this thing that is always happening. You're taking a specific moment, a specific you know, or a stream of consciousness. You even say it's just that's how strong the kinetic energy was between me and Sonny. And Prince often benefited from the fact that we were so kind of tight, you know? Do, do you guys share like any sort of uh, publishing or do you get something for those particular songs you mentioned? I, I, I mean, there are, um, there, there are, there is re remuneration through like the musicians union. Like if something like, uh, you know, in 2016, there was a spike in Prince's activity on the net. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, his music was, the sales were picking up again. So, you know, the money that you get from being, you know, either on the recording session or some, there are monies that happen in perpetuity, but they are not life changing. If that's what you're asking. Mm. Are, are you credited uh, on those songs? or as, just... as a writer? No. Okay. Mm -mm. I mean, and again, that's something you can all, you, you can get salty about things like that. But the reality is when I walked into that environment, I knew who I was working for and what the circumstances could be. So you oh, know, I get it. I, I get it. I, I, it just is what it is. If you put your hands down and play something, you know, you, you might, you, you might be giving away your um, intellectual property, let's say, mm. you know, and they, we knew he was recording constantly. So Sonny, you know, I mean, Sonny, his musical energy is irrepressible. You can't stop him from bringing, bringing funk your way. If he picks up the bass, it's going to happen right away. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was a thing. We just, sometimes we're just trying to get sounds right, you know? It's like, uh, look, 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 here. Or the engineer just, hey, uh, can you, you, will you play something? You guys play something together. And invariably, when we put our hands down, music happens. So it wasn't hard to do. It just, it just, it just happened. It happens now. I, I, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you. No, no. So it, it, I, I get what you're saying. Is it like <laughs> where, where Prince would have an ear to be able to hear something and what you're doing and be like, ah, mm -hmm. stick with yeah. this. You know, let's get I, with I that. Mean, I've, I, I mean, I've been as haughty in the past to call him a master thief because he knew what to take from and how to make things work, man. And and could and would work on it till, till it was unrecognizable to anyone else's ear. Mm -hmm. I mean, but we all are in one way, shape, or form. I'm not really singling him out. I'm just saying he's really he was really good at it. He knew how to make something out of something, right? You know, which goes into I mean, that's part of his genius. I mean, he's a that's yeah, right. I yeah. mean, nothing new under the sun. He was doing what others had done before him. I mm -hmm. heard that when In Time by Sly and the Family Stone came out, mm -hmm. that Miles Davis made his musicians like listen to just that song on repeat for hours. He was like, this is how y'all supposed to sound. So, you know, it's there's that thing. It's like, you know, bor borrowing is 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 flattery and everybody does it. And so in our in our case, if you talk about songwriting, mm -hmm. yeah, it would have been nice for him to include us in that way, but he didn't I mean, really he didn't have to do that. He didn't have to. Right. Um, just to go down that borrowing thing, um, I think I saw you mention this online. Uh, correct me if I'm mistaken. Were there instances <clears throat> where uh, you, Prince would have tapes of like Sly or whoever, and you got he would like, "Yo, check this out." Um, did, did, were there any times where you guys would just kind of geek out over other I'll, artist stuff? I'll tell you again, and this this particular conversation is taking me back to a lot of moments I, I'm I'm really thankful for that I had with him. Um, one day during the new tour rehearsal, uh, Prince and Miko and Levi started getting out about GCS, about Graham Central Station. And I'd never heard any of that. They're like, man, uh, on here, that drummer sounds like he ain't going to make it. Like the pickup on, on you know, he comes in so late with that snare pickup, you think he ain't going to get it. And they're just laughing and chucking and jiving about it. Like, and I was like, I, what, who is this? What is this? And they just started laughing at me, man. <laughs> you don't know about Grand Central Station. <laughs> and Prince said, you got to stay after school. <laughs> and yeah. rehearsal ended and I followed him to Studio A and he called his housekeeper and said, and told her what records to bring over. And she brought him over. And I spent two, three hours in, the, in, the, in, the, in Studio A 
with the phonograph. Prince was just DJing for me and explaining to me the history of the music I was listening to, who was involved, what wow. happened with this, who got the idea for that, for that. Wow. Like, he really, he gave me a, a extended education. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. now, now, now I know what I wanted to ask you about, and you can answer it if you want to. Okay. There, I had heard about this story, and then I recently saw... Mm -hmm. Somebody posted this video online. It was a rehearsal, I believe, for the nude tour. And it looks like it's like a two hour thing or something. And toward the end, it looked like I <laughs> already know where I'm going. Toward the end, something seems to happen between Miko and Prince. And I hear Prince, something's, somebody said, I don't know what something to say. Prince surprised me like. He said something like, boy, like, and then he like tried to rush Miko and he kind of went off the camera or something. Now, now, you know what I'm talking about. You was there. I was there. Was there some tension going on? Or was that an act? What, what was that about? No, that, I, I don't know. I, I mean, all I could account for was my own uh, interactions with Prince. I don't know if that was just one of those days or if maybe they had been fighting about some some girl or you know what I mean? It's like I, it's hard to say what what why the tension was there, mm -hmm. and it may have been pr purely professional. But what I remember happening, well, I think that happened while we were uh, rehearsing Kiss, and we were running like full scale rehearsal. I don't remember if we had wardrobe on, but we were running the set, and uh, Lee, uh, not Levi, Miko stopped dancing for a minute to adjust one of the knobs on his guitar. And so he stopped playing, and he and he stopped moving. And Prince happened to look over and see it. I was like, "What's wrong?" You know, and it kind of started there. And and you know, uh, well, Prince said something uh, about, "Well, you know, don't stop the choreography." And then he <laughs> then he said, <laughs> and, "And keep playing. What you know, like like what's your problem?" And it kind of escalated from there. <laughs> And Levi, uh, Levi, I keep saying Levi, Miko didn't, uh, you know, it was seemed to be just an inconsequential moment until it turned up. It was like, boy, don't you ever, you know, <laughs> and uh, I, I'll whoop your ass like your, like your daddy said, you know, so on and so forth. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and Miko was, was off the mic, but he was like, you know, your little ass ain't going to do nothing. You know, you will come on out, come on outside, you know. Oh, shit. And, um, it, uh, and uh, I think Prince might have been actually sorry. I think Prince was the one who suggested they go outside, and Miko was saying, "Yeah, I'll meet you outside across the street. I'm not going to hit you on your own property." You say something about his bodyguards or something like you have your security. So, yeah, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah, he probably have. Yeah, like you ain't going to fight your own fight anyway. You know, I, you know, he's like, "I'll meet you at McGlynn's. McGlynn's is a bakery across the street <laughs> from Paisley Park." Hilarious. And so he's like, I'll be, you, you smell these donuts going to work, man. It was, <laughs> it was like that. It was it a dog in, in those cartoons or he started. Mm, oh, yeah. yeah. Like, oh, yeah. 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 Snuffles. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was like that. You get out the car in the, in, the, in Paisley's lot and you saw them donuts. You wanted to just float over there. Hilarious. <laughs> but um, bringing you back. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be toward McGlynn's. You ain't going to do nothing. You know, and it was that was what it was. I, you know, I think he quit. He's like, I'm going, to, man. I'm, I think I'm tired. Of, uh, forget this. And I think Miko flew back to San Francisco, and like came back two days later or something like that. Mm -hmm. He might have even he might not have not have even left town. I don't remember exactly, but I know they patched it up. We kept moving. Oh, okay. Had that type yeah. of stuff happened before or or after where he just got that? Tense in the rehearsal. Every once in a while, you'd see, you know, somebody would would just test Prince on the wrong day, and uh, I remember he was looking for. He had just fired some technician that had been working for him. I think it might have been somebody on the on the on the tour crew. Like we were rehearsing at Paisley, and um, one of the dudes who had been there for quite a while, I think, uh, let it make him a little bit careless. Mm. Uh, and he was holding up a sign like behind us that Prince could see, but we couldn't with this dude's name on it who had just been fired. Mm. And and Prince was like, 
uh, he saw that and he slowly kind of escalated. You know, I didn't know what he was talking about because I didn't see the sign. And he, well, certain people are here for certain reasons and certain people are not here for certain reasons. And I'll thank you, good sir, to have the decency and the respect that a grown man deserves. Uh, he just escalated from there. And this dude was gone by the end of the day. That was Prince saying that? Oh, yeah. Wow. See, we don't see that side of Prince. <laughs> I, I mean, but you have to imagine it's there. Anybody for who sure. does anything well has a pressure valve. <clears throat> you know what I mean? It's like you, if, if you take anything serious in life, then it can't be fun and games all the time. Right. That, that's the easiest way I could say it. So you got to understand. I mean, even <laughs> I thought that was funny when Larry King tried to, tried to get him. When uh, he, Larry King asked Princess, and so do you get upset? <laughs> Did you see that interview? I've seen it, but I, I can't uh -huh. think of that, that particular I, man, that was We were cracking up. Sonny saw that. We were mad. We were dying. <laughs> and Prince tried to you know, come with the, well, I, I mean, no, I feel like as a, you know, <laughs> a sentient being, we all should be able to roll out. He was to roll out something. And Larry King was like, come on, man. I mean, you're an artist. You got to get upset sometimes. It's, it goes with the, it's part of the course. I mean, don't tell me, you know, and Prince kind of, back, he backpedaled a little bit. Hilarious. You know? <laughs> okay, Larry, get the get the truth out of him now. <laughs> Did Prince? Talk, that's, I'm just saying this is the fun, but you just made it. You just mentioned something. A lot of times when you see Prince on uh, interviews, and I guess it depends on who he was talking to, but he would kind of almost what I would call like that Prince kind of Yoda sensei speak. You know what I mean? Like he was real talking, like uh, you know just that on that real other stuff where he's real kind of like on some, he, big vocabulary and be trying to drop jewels and stuff, which he was. But when y'all talk, <laughs> talk to each other, was he, would he talk to you guys like that? You know what I'm saying? Like, or would he oh, be just sure. like a regular I mean, person? I, he could be both. Mm. Some days he was trying to make you a believer and other days he was just, uh, you know, just telling you about some kid who tried to fight him in fourth grade. <laughs> That's funny. Man. Okay. Um, uh, another pinnacle moment to me, it seemed like it was a change I to ask you about <clears throat> was, uh, going into 1994. Oh no, before that, I'm sorry. The undertaker. Oh boy. Yeah. The undertaker. Um, for those who don't know, and you can correct me cause you're on that. So you don't know it better than me, but this was a project or I don't know if this is just something that had, that happened, but it, it was a, uh, it was two things, right? It was a uh, audio uh, and a video. I think the video was released overseas on Laserdisc or something like that. It was very rare. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a plan to have it release the CD on like Guitar Magazine or something like that at some point. My understanding was his original idea was that it was going to appear in Guitar Player Magazine because they did these floppies, like these mm -hmm. records you could you could put you, like you could take it out of the magazine and put it on your turntable. Yeah. And uh, I think he wanted to do that, but he also, I think, sent the master of The Undertaker, excuse me, to, um, I want to say it's a duplication plant called Zymox. And hmm. it's like X-Y-M-O-X. And I think they were a local um, uh, manufacturer of CDs. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. And he was just going to press like a thousand of them. And... Somebody noticed that the work order came from Paisley Park. It's like, wait a minute, we didn't haven't been informed by Warner Brothers. <laughs> it, like the proper the corresponding paperwork wasn't there. So it raised eyebrows and they ended up calling around. And I think that's how Warner Brothers found out he was having plans to do it. So somebody at the manufacturing plant, this is a local at, company, at, they at the duplication plant. Stitching yeah. out, calling a Warner Brothers. That's like, something. hey, you guys have a have a uh, like a, a Prince record on your schedule? Wow. You know, like, and then it was like, well, no, why? What do you got? And uh, so they, somebody, I'm sure somebody called him and politely explained to him that you're under contract and you can't just release whatever you want when you feel like it. Mm. And it wasn't a big deal to him at the time, but that situation obviously, you know, <laughs> so led to other led things. Into, right. <laughs> Was that a project that you guys planned on doing or was that like just a, cause it wasn't like you guys, it was a three, it was you three, it was uh, yourself, Sonny and Prince. 
Did you just record that in one go, or what, what was that process like? Then? Yeah, it was, it was recorded in one go. What happened? It's it, really it's and it's hardly ever like it's always like nothing, and then it turns into a plan. Really, it was like we were on Christmas Christmas vacation because legally in Minnesota you're given a certain amount of days, no matter what. Mm. Like you can't make nobody work on Christmas, and at least at that time it was like that. So. Um, Tommy and Morris left town for Christmas, Christmas vacation. Sonny and I stayed and neither of us had any plans, any, anything that really, you know, it, uh, um, that, uh, kept us held up for any particular reason. We were just free and hanging out in town. And, uh, Prince called me and said, um, he was bored as I am. Mm-hmm. And, I think I said, yeah, even though it's like that dude has had a shortest attention span of anybody I knew. <laughs> you know, I was like, well, yeah, I'm not really doing much. It's like, well, you, you want to jam? You, you want to just, you know, like just kind of just, you know, just play. I said, uh, okay, well, let me get in touch with Sonny and see if he's, you know, if he's free. So I, I got in touch with Sonny and we both went out there and, uh, we just sort of started playing. Just Prince figured out that he had a shorthand sort of way of that that we could follow, that we kind of could sense where he was trying to go before he went there. Mm. And so it made it really easy to play as a trio because Sonny and I both have something that's called perfect pitch. And that means that without having an instrument in your hand, you know what the music is, what the key is, mm-hmm. you know, how, how the relative harmony, all of that. Um, so he started playing. I know how, what the tempo is. I just have to decide what, what kind of feel I want to come with. And Sonny already knows what key he's in. So Prince could literally just start something out of the air. And me and Sonny kind of looking at each other, oh, okay, all right. And then we just come in. <laughs> <laughs> And it was, you know, it might take a couple of bars to figure out where we, what we're really trying to say, you know, but it would get to some spot and Prince was getting really inspired by that. And he found this whole new sort of sense of freedom when it was just us three, because nobody had to ask, well, what key is this? We'll chase it down. And there was nobody uh, playing another instrument that, that necessarily played chords. So whatever he played, whatever he felt to play, mm-hmm. and there were no mistakes, you know, so that's how uh, so much of that music happened in, in, in such a short amount of time. And us, on top of that, we were even playing stuff that we played as the full band, us as the three of us. So all like one time he just uh, that's how Bambi happened. We didn't that was a, something we hadn't played Bambi in um in, in, like probably in years at that point. Hmm. But um. Yeah, he just started playing it, so we knew what to do. Um, and that's also in The Undertaker. Some of those other songs we have been playing around with in rehearsal mm-hmm. or during these jam sessions. So the music was being developed, kind of, but not really. I mean, it was just it was in this sort of shape and form, but really the, the freedom was what he was really gravitated to. He gravitated towards being able to just do what he felt. Man, yeah. yeah, that's amazing, man. That when it was over, did you guys kind of know, like, yeah, that was that was some shit right there. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> a, 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 like um, at the end of Billy Jack Mitch, that you hear Sonny unplugging his uh, plugging his bass, <laughs> you hear us giggling because we knew that was that was some mess. Whoa, whoa, Sonny, whoa, 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 whoa! I'm sorry, you just kind of blowing my head. Are you telling me that y'all recorded that in that same time? No, but oh. what I'm saying is we often. We oh, always knew saying. when we had something good. Gotcha. And yeah. as soon as Sonny said that, it's like, y'all some tight mother, you know. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it was like, that's going on the record. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me about Billy Jack Bitch. What, what, was that uh, another one of these sort of jam session things that turned into something? Or? Nah, that was a, that was an idea he had. Like, okay. When, once you get beyond the Symbol album, you're talking about a, a lot of music that had very specific purpose. Okay. You know, like he was working on ideas. I mean, because pretty much 
towards, I guess, toward, that would have been like the around the beginning of 1994. Whatever happened, he had this conversation with somebody at Warner Brothers about um, his music being old by the time it came out because they, you know, they got they have over a thousand artists on their roster and Prince gets 10 minutes a week like everybody else. But um, he was complaining that they were taking too long to get his music out. And mm. they were contesting that he didn't have a valid criticism. And they made, they gave him permission to do The Most Beautiful Girl in the World uh, as an independent release to see how it would go. Like he wanted to see if he could really make it on his own without them. And of course, it was the most you know commercial song he had had out in a long time. Mm-hmm. It, he wasn't going to blow that chance. He was going to put out a bona fide hit. So we worked on it. It came out on, I think it was Edel, like a German label. And it went through the roof, you know? And of course, Prince didn't stop there. It was greeting cards and, you know, remixes. And so on and so forth. He, he juiced it. He made a lot of money on that. And, you know, all to, to uh, you know, basically to prove to Warner Brothers, like, I don't need you. You need me, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I, I'm not sure what we were talking about, man. I'm sorry. No, no. This is leading into what I wanted to go to. So 1994, yeah, uh, okay. Valentine's mm-hmm. Day. Paisley mm-hmm. Park. Uh, it was the NBA All Star Weekend. Oh boy! Yeah, and you guys had that show that mm-hmm. night, and I believe that show there was debuting the video of "Beautiful Girl," but you also you guys did this performance, uh, which is one of my favorite shows. This is also the performances are also the basis of that. Uh, the, uh, what was it? What was that thing called? What was the thing with Nona Gay called? It escapes me. The, the, the little video movie type thing. Oh, the, the beautiful experience. Beautiful maybe? experience. Yes. Yeah. So some okay. of those performances are on there, but that particular show, a couple things I wanted to ask you about. The first thing, one it, that that was the uh, seemed like the public's introduction to this new configuration of the band, right? Uh, or, probably. You're probably okay. right. I. I I don't recall, but you're probably right about that. It may be. Well, I know it's so it was uh it was it was you, Sonny, Morris, Tommy Barbarella, and Maite. Uh-huh. And Prince, of course. Yes. And you guys were doing all new songs, at least to the public, <laughs> at that yeah. point. And um one of the songs I wanted to ask you about was the song uh Shh. Okay. Uh so is, is the rumor or the myth correct that uh, Tevin Campbell was supposed to come up there and sing during this part? Well, that's what Prince wanted, but Tevin wanted to do Can We Talk? And oh, we really? didn't know that one. Ah, yeah. Okay. He was like, well, why would I want to play one of the songs I didn't write for you? <laughs> I was like, well, no, we're not going to do that. So I guess, all right. I mean, you guys had been re- obviously pre- rehearsing and playing that song, though, right? Because, I mean, mm-hmm. he killed that, man. Y'all killed that. <laughs> well, that really, I mean, up until the day before we shot that thing, that arrangement was still coming together. Like, literally, the day before, it was like, if I'm going to do it, I want it to be this tame, you know, slow jam. You know, we got to come out like thunder. Like, I remember him talking to us, and they were in the rehearsal room in Studio C. Like, no, no, we got to you know, like, make a statement. Like, we need some... <laughs> you need to fill all up that, fill that space up. You know, just solo wow. through all that. And I'm thinking... Okay, uh, I don't know what I'm going to play, but I guess I'm about to put my hands down and see what happens. So, yeah, with a, a day, you know, a day's worth of preparation on no sleep for probably three days. Wow. That's a, that, man, that NBA week was, that was a rough ride, man. Wow, man, you, you you destroyed that, man. That was forever a classic, oh. man. Like, jeez. I, I didn't do what I wanted. I, I, really? Once the gold experience came out, that was what I was trying to say. But it took some time for me to get it in a space where I felt like what I was playing was telling a particular story. You know? Wow. Uh, so uh, I still want to ask some more questions about that show. But in terms of you mentioned the gold experience and stuff, were those albums to you guys already sort of, you know, 
outlined or you were they a part of albums at that time or were they just songs that you guys had all these songs that you were doing um until until Calm came out it was just a big grouping of songs that didn't have any particular affiliation mm. and then when he started talking about the gold experience about and, and i think that was around when we probably cut interactive and some other songs like that but he started talking about online music service and so on and so forth. The Prince was the first one to even told. Me. He said, someday computers, uh, people are going to buy music, you know, through their computers. Mm. We looked at each other like, you crazy. <laughs> and, but he was right about it. And he was the first one to try it. He just didn't, he, he didn't have the business acumen or enough information about like infrastructure. Right. To really do it the right way the first time. Often the first guy does it wrong. I mean, you know, but you can't discredit him for, you know, setting out on a new frontier. Mm -hmm. He just he just didn't do it. You know, people complained that they didn't get the records on time, you know, so on and so forth. There was a, some issue with Best Buy. Like, oh, I could buy, I bought it last week at Best Buy. I'm still waiting on my copy from 1 800 New Funk. What's going on? You know, like all that. I don't know. You take the good with the bad, I guess. He knew what he was talking about. He just didn't have a, a, a sound model in terms of execution or the delivery system, you know? Right. I mean, basically, he was he had the idea and the vision for it. He just didn't have, you know, like, like these, you know, Amazon, they got like a whole team that can just do analytics to figure out the best way to implement yeah. the situation. But I mean, at some point, right. Prince was literally online sometimes, like taking 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 orders. <laughs> like That's fine. when it started, like he was really involved. I, I, I think I met somebody who said they called in one time and they think it was him who answered the phone. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, that, that, that's the other thing is he was a very uh, hands-on type of dude. Like he was not the type of boss who would um, ask you to do anything that he would do himself. Hmm. To, to his credit. <laughs> I seen him moving gear one time. I mean, he couldn't move a lot, <laughs> but I but I saw him helping. He was the first one to jump in, like, "Hey, let's get this moving." Wow. You okay. Know? <laughs> um, there's another part in that 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 particular performance. If you can remember, I think you guys were doing a Ray Charles thing or something covering, and I I haven't seen the video of this part, so I'm just going off of the audio. But it sounded like there was some guitar player. Something mm -hmm. that came up on stage and was having some issues, and I mean, Prince was clown clowned him out. Is, yeah, who, who, do you know who that? Who was that? Like, how does that person be able to get on stage to play with Prince at an event like that? Well, he was in the front row, going, "I could smoke you, dude. I could smoke you." Hilarious. And um, and Prince finally let him up, and ironically, it's actually somebody that I do know, and um, <laughs> he starts stepping on the pedals, and nothing was really happening. And he claimed that Prince, you know, turned something off and couldn't find the switch. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I mean, they make up it. your own mind if you think Prince is capable of doing something. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, what is the word for clandestine or secret, you know, but uh, that's what he said. He told me himself, like, man. He 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 turned off the juice somewhere, man. One of those like the distortion pedal. I wasn't getting any, any signal. <laughs> and like he did something. That was that was his take on it. And you know, I'm I'm not a guitar player, and I don't know what's possible or impossible. But I guess truth is out there. <laughs> the, the, yes, <laughs> the truth is out there, and uh, you know, it was that was a, a. I think he he got in like in the building. With a with a with a friend of his who probably was somebody because it was hard to get in. Mm, mm, okay, they called him Bud Light. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, he was clowning. Yeah. <laughs> no, he was no Prince was clowning that dude. That dude actually is a is a good guitar player. Oh, okay, all right, yeah. And then, oh, I also this is a so you can unlock these mysteries for me. I always wonder. You guys had done, and at the end of this show, you guys do a uh, salt and pepper <laughs> uh, thing. None of my business. Uh -huh. but, but then I also saw that you guys did, um, I think it was on the Glam Slam South Beach shows. You did a uh, shoomp. 
And like he was ramping over that salt and pepper song. Was was there some sort of salt and pepper Prince connection that we're not aware of or something like that? Well, here's the thing is that we were rehearsing music. We were preparing all that music for all the people who were going to be showing up at the All-Star party. Mm. Like Prince wanted these people to come up and perform. Salt and pepper didn't want to do it. Ah. So we just did it. And it kind of, Prince kind of dug doing it himself. He didn't need them. So it would just pop up sometimes. Okay. Same with Tevin. He didn't want to do shush. So Prince said, well, then I'll do it. And that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, and um, talk to me about those. You guys, you guys did like, they were called the interactive shows. They were like being beamed through the satellite or something to the different glam slam clubs. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, that's how it was supposed to work. Um, we did shows at all the glam slams, except for, I guess, the one in Yokohama. We did Miami, we did L.A., and we did um, uh, Minneapolis. And every night that we appeared at one of them, the other two clubs had, like, a simulcast going on. Okay. Yeah. Man, that used to be a hot... This is back in the VHS tape days. <laughs> in, the under, in the underground, like where you had to go buy, I don't know, it was a magazine. Was it called Record Collector or something? We used oh. to used to get those, uh, get the magazine at Tower Records, and in the back it'd be classified ads, and they'd be some in there like rare Prince tape or something like that. But you had to send out, you know, send in the mail to get it. <laughs> man, I got that VHS tape of that show. Man, I was done. Man, y'all, was, I was like, God damn. Y'all, oh, y'all was killing it. Yeah, the only thing I wish is that we hadn't stayed in Miami for so long, man. It was it was so humid. And just, <laughs> you get out the shower and you're wet all day. And, and, man, I just, I, I'm not made for the, for that type of climate. What? <laughs> I'm a big bro, man. man we're tropical, tropical people, man. The Europeans deal with this madness. No, just joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, yeah, don't eat juices and juices, only juices and berries. <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, man, it's coming to America too, man. What's oh man? I'm oh, what's so up excited. with that? Yeah, yeah. It I'm better be mad. good. Better be good. That's the one thing that I, that I will agree with you on. It better not be no dud. Yeah, Eddie will never hear the end of it. That that could like throw his whole plan off. <laughs> he might have to come out and do that. What's up it, with you? <laughs> <Let me stop. laughs> oh. oh, oh, okay. So uh, mm. another dope album, The Exodus. Oh, Exodus. <laughs> what was All the right. story behind this, man? Like, how did that come to be? Um, Prince had some things on his mind that he wanted to say, but didn't want to have to uh, get into so, any sort of, like, legal uh, battles. So he made Sun Sam. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Now, did, had Sonny sung? I, that was so weird to me because I was like, man, Sonny, he's, he's getting down. I was like, Sonny lead singing? I, didn't, Sonny's, I keep telling you, Sonny is all, man. Son, wow. Sonny plays guitar, he plays bass. He, I've seen him sit down at the drums. Really? He plays keyboard, he plays he plays keys. Sonny is, is a complete uh, musician. Yeah. And so you guys, what was the sessions like for this? Were these songs that Prince had already had? I've heard some of them where it was his vocals and then he swapped them out. But did you got you guys played on some of these songs too, though, right? Or all of them? I don't know. That was that was all, uh, only uh, there was a version of Get Wild before the one that came out on that record. That was uh, a little more live feeling, like it was it was us playing the the rhythm tracks, but um, Is that like a go go feel to it almost. Or something? It probably I'm like mm. like we cut it like um to, like as, as a rhythm section, and I don't think there was anything necessarily wrong with it, but it wasn't what Prince was trying to get out of it. So he went back and retooled it with all the the, the programming and mm. the uh, you know and he sampled the horns and put them where he wanted them to go, and um, and Sonny sang lead over that, and we were we we're all singing on the backgrounds and stuff. Um, but um, I think he. Really, literally, he wanted to say some things, like the Exodus has begun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, if you really get into the words, then you pretty much can conclude for yourself that he's talking about Warner Brothers' record. Man. And uh, also, um, slave to the system. I don't know if you've heard that. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. That was another mm -hmm. one of those where it's like, oh, well, I can't say it because I'm gonna get in trouble. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make Sonny say it. 
It's the whole Torah, Torah persona. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that, y'all performances in that, in that period was, they was fire, man. Like, and that's what I also, that's why I also wanted to ask you, how challenging it was it for you to play with these sample loops and stuff? I, I sometimes I'll be listening, I'll be listening real hard. I could, sometimes I could hear a point where they get off a little bit, but they you mm-hmm. jump back on it. But how, what was that like for you as a drummer? Um, I mean, it was, uh, it was, it was hard. It was hard. It's hard to do. It'd be hard for anybody. It's uh, because you're talking about trying to play consistently against something that could be any degree of inconsistent in and of itself. Hmm. Um, kind of like, uh, I, I mean, I don't know if I want to get into like tweezing it and exposing everything, <laughs> but I, 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 a lot of those loops that are uh, on a lot of like, you know, hip hop records or rap records. Mm-hmm. Those are human beings playing those drums. So it's not like they're metronomically right. accurate. So I have to make a, I had to make a lot of uh, unorthodox adjustments. Like if the beat, if, if the, if the loop speeds up at a certain spot, I got to calculate for that. Wow. Or if it drags at a certain spot. Now it's coming around. It's a loop, so the same inconsistencies are coming at you over and over again. But um, it's really kind of a—it just requires a, a, a lot of practice and a lot of concentration. Who, I, I don't know what to tell you. No, nah, who was this? Uh, I mean, obviously, some, it's a Prince thing, but was this something uh, that Morris Hayes? Uh, is that like sort of his brainchild to really be, you know, bringing in that, that type of production with the programming of the beats and that type of thing in the live setting? Was that his? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. Uh, Levi went to, um, I think it was G Sharp and the Edge. They had a band. G and Morris had a band. They had moved up here from Arkansas and they basically became Minnesotans. They came up actually to join Maserati, but okay. um, the second album got shelved. And um, but they were putting something else together with, with a few dudes that we knew. And Levi, I don't know what his connection with them was, but Levi had gone to one of their rehearsals and they were already playing with loops and everything. Like Morris was already already had them, you know, and it was sounding all fat. Hmm. So Levi came back and told Prince about it. And then Prince went with Levi the next time to the rehearsal, I think. And started they started peeping the technology and Ask Morris how's it how it's done. And I come to rehearsal one day and there's an Alesis drum machine there mm-hmm. and like some different samples on my pads and like, okay, this is how this th- happens and so on. I had a kill switch for things like that before, but this is something else. Like when I joined the band, like um for instance, um introduction in the new tour, like with the future and all that, like that's that's a that's that's a, a loop of like the Lynn drum machine, mm-hmm. you know. And um, what I had to the right of my kick drum pedal was a modified pedal that had somebody put a piece of tape on it and in gigantic black sharpie letters that said "kill," <laughs> and that was the pedal I used to turn that on and off. Wow. And um, I, I, anyway, long story short, more showed the technology to whoever needed to know. And soon after we were doing the same thing. It it was a period of adjustment, but I mean, nothing like for me, nothing like for Bobby Z when, (laughs) when he walked in and everything was, you know, that Lynn machine was working. And so they had to figure out how to work with it. It was just that Princess decided this is the way we're going. And Bobby had to readjust what, you know, what he was doing to fit what Prince was after. Mm -hmm. And so it was not nearly as difficult for me as it was for him. I'm sure. Interesting. Uh, This is a question. I think somebody asked this and I'm curious what you'll say. Uh, I think they were paraphrasing. They were asking like, if something happened to you in your wrist or something was sprained before the performance and you, and you had to pick a previous or a Prince, another Prince drummer, who, who would you pick to, to replace you? 
back then? Oh, I'm almost positive the person he would have called was Sheila. No, I'm saying who would you pick if any drummer? I, I mean, I, I think she would be the one that, that was most qualified. Okay. Sheila E. Man, I thought the, the, the Sign of the Times Glove Sexy Band was incredible. It was badass. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, sorry, I got high, uh, distracted. I'll edit that out. That's all right, man. It's, you can do what you want. <laughs> do, do what you feel you need to. Um, all <laughs> right. So, oh, so also the Gold Experience Come album Exodus. From your standpoint, these albums, or at least the Gold album, seem to take a while to come out. And I believe by the time it came out, for a lot of the fans, we had already heard a lot of those songs at that point. We had seen the beautiful experience. A lot of things were leaking out. Were you guys aware of the fact that most of the fans had already heard this material by the time the album dropped? I'm not sure. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know that... Um, we had to know on some level. I mean, it wasn't like Prince was keeping it secret that he had a record that he wasn't planning on putting out. I mean, right. we toured the UK uh, playing the entire Gold Experience and then like some of the hits after. I think actually what he ended up doing was that's why we did the Purple Medley. We had to learn um. the Purple Medley live <laughs> like to, to play because I mean, Prince was really like, uh, yeah, I mean, it happens to them all. They get sick of playing all their old hits. And they want to do something different. But a lot of the promoters, uh, they wanted in writing that you're going to play certain, you know, like you're going to play at least four of your hits, it, uh, including but not limited to, you know, Kiss, <laughs> Purple Rain, Let's Go Crazy. You know, they got their list. And so Prince's way of kind of just silencing all of those dudes was okay. Well, I just I did the purple medley. Now we're gonna learn how to play it, and that was a daunting task, man. Wow, a lot of program changes, and a, you know, a lot of just a lot of preparation. That makes me remember the, uh, uh, the American Musical Awards. It was a performance, and you guys did like uh, the medley of some of the gold songs. Uh, sure. There was and so watching it on TV was very interesting because I don't know what was happening on stage, but they would I don't know if you were aware that you know they would pull the camera all the way back so we couldn't actually see what Prince and Mighty were doing. Do you remember any of this? Like Um I've seen that footage many times. And uh I'm sure that that is probably what's going on, but I, I actually honestly when I watch it, the 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 part I'm most uh um, the distracting part for me is like how Prince seems to appear out of nowhere. <laughs> that is incredible. <laughs> and so I got I, 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 oh, here it comes. And you just see him do the reverse splits out of nowhere and, and start singing. <laughs> <laughs> um, up, so, up. so that may be true, but I never really noticed that. Uh, okay. Um, I was going to ask you, of the, of the TV performances that you were a part of, and man, like, you were a part of a time when some of the to me, some of the best TV performances of Prince ever. Uh, what was the most memorable ones for you? And we weren't on that often. There was all sorts of stuff we right. wanted to do with Prince that he would say no to uh, and and said no to all the way up until basically it felt like once Emancipation came out, mm -hmm. like he was ready to do all the yeah. stuff <laughs> right. that he wouldn't do. Man, we really felt like Man, we wanted to play the Essence Festival, Festival back in 93. Really? And he wouldn't do it. You know, like a lot of stuff they got to do. I mean, I don't mind saying I was a little bit out of shape because I was like, we there were so many things that we felt we could have done that were, I don't want to say more on like a black level. You could say that. But <laughs> that's what I mean, man. It's like, I, you know, and I hate to be the one to say that sort of thing because I don't really think it's, I don't think that Chris was, you know, the type of dude who pandered very much. Like he wouldn't, didn't really readjust his program for the sake of, you know, uh, trying to fit into every circumstance. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But um, just some of the stuff, just as a black person, I would, that, that, I never got to play the essence best. And mm -hmm. uh, we would, like Morris usually be the one asking him, hey, 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 bruh, 
You know, we could do that. <laughs> we, and it just depended on what he felt like doing or not doing. But also, I realized you got a new album to, uh, you know, you got a new album out. You got something to prove. You trying to reach everybody. So, yeah, I guess now I'll go on Oprah. Now I'll do this. Now I'll do that. You know what I mean? Just like a right. lot of things. We spent more time in, in Paisley Park as, as a place, you know, than I, the, I, probably anybody. Like as far as like consecutive days, years worth of time in rehearsal mm-hmm. or doing projects, you know, doing projects that were just that were only there. You know, like a lot of videos, too. Right. I guess. Yeah. I was like, if we spent the majority of our time with Prince in that building. We like a lot of the tours were shorter, short or shorter. Um, the longest tour I did with him was a new tour. That was three and a half months. And that didn't even play in America, did it? That's not even getting to play in America. Mm-hmm. Then we thought like after we did our Arsenio, there was a plan to, to, to announce the U.S. tour. And. I remember we were all at Prince's house in L.A. because uh, we went out there to shoot the thing. We were at his house, and the performance just, the show just finished. And was like, woo, man, man, we killed that. You know, everybody was, yeah. you know. And I, I said, uh, so I said, uh, well, when are we going to tour the States? And Prince looked at me and said, we just did. <laughs> that was 50 million people watching. Wow. We're going to Europe. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> that was when the Dimes and Pearls tour went to Europe and Japan. I mean, and there was Australia also on that that trip. Yeah, I remember being. I was a fan. I was like, "What's going on? Like, how come we're not getting? <laughs> we ain't getting no love over here." <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I mean, I could speculate and say that he was probably spooked by how the Love Sexy tour rolled out. Hmm. I mean, it. it I, I think it was a, an artistic triumph. But I think the ticket sales said otherwise. And I think he may have been a little uh, convoluted about the idea of risking it again, because that don't look good. Yeah, but I agree with you. It was an art. I was blown away by that show, man. That show was fantastic. I, I mean, that's the thing I wish that somebody could say, yo, Prince, man, we got love for you over here. I don't know what they telling you, bro. We come out, you know, whenever you come out, we're going to be there. Yeah, I, but, I, well, you can't talk a person out of their experience, Michael Dean. We went over that. True, true, true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. I said that 48 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we will wrap this. Well, a few, a few more things. Um, also of note, at least to me, you were in, uh, a part of this Madhouse 24 or one of the configurations uh, of that album. How did that those sessions come to play. Wow. I, literally, I remember walking walking in. To, I had been at Paisley till about six in the morning. And I went home and around 10 or so, I got called into the studio. And I was hot about it. <laughs> like we, were, we had been working like late hours, and um, I mean, we were always working the guys, but I just some, it must have just caught up with me. I was I was hostile, and uh, I went though, and I pretty much just stood out on the drums. You know that song "Ass Whoop." Yeah, that was like one of the first ones we did. And if <laughs> if you notice, I'm being kind of greedy the whole time. <laughs> I was just I was just upset about having having to having to be there, and uh, I, so it wasn't discussed or anything. I just walked into it. Eric was there with the horn. Uh, you know, like everybody was just there and I didn't know what we were working on. Mm. Uh, so I just got, took, took my position and, and awaited instruction. That's it. Interesting. Did, did you, uh, do you feel appreciated while you were there at during this time? Um, appreciated. Yeah. I, you know, I, I wish I had a more clear cut sort of answer, but you know, I, uh, I gotta see this. Michael D. Um, how I came up, you don't get credit for doing the right thing or for being excellent. Mm-hmm. You just, you just are. You don't wait. You, you, you're never supposed to be waiting around for somebody to pat you on the back and say you're doing a good job. And and I didn't need that. And Prince didn't give me that. Not often. You know. Hmm. Sometimes he would. 
And but I I, would, I wasn't standing around waiting for his approval. I figured the approval was in the fact that I, that I was still there. Did you? Would well, I don't know how to say? Would you have wanted that though? I I, I don't. I think it would be inconsequential to me, like it is kind of now. When people walk up to me and they compliment me, I have to be careful not to give them the impression that I'm just shining them on and going, whatever. But <laughs> in my heart, you know, and also in, 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 I like, I know what I'm able to do. I know when I'm excelling and I know when I'm failing. So it's nice to hear it, but it don't really, it don't, it, it, it's nice to hear it. I don't need it. I'm always measuring my, my, uh, my progress. Okay. I, I only asked that because what you were saying, like, maybe you were just tired and ready to go home. No, I was tired. Sleep. Like, I had, like, three hours of sleep. I got you. And all day the day before was probably one of those days where we were doing a lot of sitting around and waiting. And, you know, I mean, it's just people uh, continued to ask me for quite some time after after he fired us. Like, you know, well, you know, he's, you know, you're like his favorite, man. Why don't you just go back? <laughs> and I try to explain to him that it's not that simple. Playing with Prince in, in the form that he was in at that point, at the way he was at, at that time, that's a young man's game. Like, you really got to have nothing else going on in your life. Mm. Like, you got to, you, we pretty much, at the time when I joined his band, I had a lot to give it. But, you know, after after I had to go out into the world and find my own way, you know, I, I got uh, accustomed to doing things in a different manner. I got used to uh, things happening because I say so. Mm. And and I didn't have to wait for anybody. And if I was, I had the the wherewithal and the the competence to say, hey, you're messing up my program, man. You know, like I, I, I believe in equal work for, for all equal consideration because that's the only way you can move forward in life. You got to be around people who are after the same thing that you are, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know what I'm telling you at, at this point. I, I just, I guess I'm just responding to, to right, your asking, right. but it's, yeah, it's, I don't know. People say, is it hard to work with principal? No, it's not hard. As long as you know what's required of you and mm -hmm. you're all right with that, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard if, if you're lazy, it's hard if, you know, if you're afraid to, to branch out artistically or expose who you are or, you know, use your voice. Yeah, then it can be hard. But the, the job is the job. And some people can feel it and others can't. I mean, there are incredible musicians. I'm not saying. Uh, I, I'm First of all, I'm not claiming to be the best drummer that he had. I know for a fact to sit in that chair, it takes having more than most. No matter who the, who you're talking about, mm -hmm. working for him and being able to hang, because you have to be almost as, as you have to be almost as good or as good at, at, at what you do as he was at what he did. So I don't think people realize that. To in order to work with a genius, you got to be a genius. Was there a room? This is funny. So with that, is there room? For if the musician wasn't like the you know the, the best in the in the industry or something like that, but they had the discipline and could follow instruction well, would they would they would they be able to learn some of the chops they needed if they were more than capable to sort of give themselves over to his situation? Yeah, because uh, everything that I was capable of doing, he didn't necessarily have use for. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that. It starts with your character. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It starts with your char character and a, a willingness to, to be open-minded and learn. And some people will, will, will uh, be defensive. And once you become defensive, if you're dealing with the artist artistic process, you're, um, you're out of it already. You're, you're too, too aware of self. To even make a sound, you know what I mean. Mm. Mm. So that's a, it. It's really had more to do with the personality type. Like Prince could say things to me that would roll off, you know, the back of my neck that other people might start crying about. Mm. And, and it all comes down to your perspective, 
where you, where you come from, how you live, what you expect from yourself, you know, uh, how bad you feel you need the job, a lot of things, you know. Uh, that's interesting. So you mentioned earlier you got you got fired. Like what what was was that? Did you see that coming, or or was it a surprise? Did you feel mutual? Uh well, at, at at its inception, um, I think I probably I I think if you ask any of my friends that were around me at that time, I was probably pretty hot about it. Mm. Um, and uh, it I don't I don't want to say it was a surprise. Like he had said something to us like maybe the week before about like I have an offer uh, to go to Australia for two million dollars a show. And I don't want to do it. I don't feel like I'm in that place right now. You know, I don't know what my future holds. And I'm just telling you guys this now because, you know, you may have to find other work, you know, either during the time in between or just in general. So he kind of said as much. And we didn't really know when that was going to happen. And within probably a week from then, um, two things happened. <laughs> we got uh, they call them it's it's a yellow slip, right? Mm -hmm. We got or yellow pink slips. Slip. <laughs> it's, oh, okay, it was a pink slip. We got our pink slips, and then um, but then Edel want, decided they wanted like they decided they wanted to put out Exodus. So it was weird because it's like we thought we were officially let go, but then. We were being uh, asked to sign these contracts to um, uh, to, 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 so that they could put the record out, and it was um, there was some money that went with it. You know, in retrospect, I think that probably Prince decided to give us. You know, he probably felt some kind of way about how things were going on. I think that he decided that he would give us the advance money to split. So, like, I see that now. I didn't see it then. You, you, you said he felt some kind of bad what was going on. What do you mean? What was uh, just about how things were happening. Like, he, he had just told us that we were probably going to be fired. You know, he knew we had no other visible means of support. We've been living in this building for years, you know? Mm. So it was going to take some time anyway for us to resurface in the world as civilians and, and figure out where, where to go from there. I think instead of keeping the advance money for Exodus, he gave it. He, he he gave some of it to us, or he gave it all to us. Okay. I mean, it wasn't like life changing money, but it was definitely enough to help through a transition. Interesting. But um, there was actually, and shortly after that, he called everybody out to Paisley for a meeting. This is probably like uh, even like the next week, and uh, I had had some time to think about things at that point. And I had kind of gotten my dandruff up like, okay, well, I, 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 I think I'm going to consider myself outside of the kingdom now. Like, I'm going to start working on me and uh, start assembling a game plan for my own life. And out of nowhere, uh, Paisley called the house and, um, and my ex-wife answered the phone. And she, she paged me and I, I got to pay phone. or what? Like, I guess Prince wants to have a meeting out of Paisley. You know, like with you and Tommy and Sonny and Morris. And uh, I said, okay. And um, I was at lunch with a friend, and the whole time he was talking, I was like, do I really want to go back out there and, you know, try to, try to, try to work things out? And I kind of decided at that point, no, I didn't want to. Hmm. I decided that he, he, as much as I was upset, he did me a favor. He did, a, did me a favor because I, I was sick and tired and he was sick and tired. And the, the tension was mounting between us and him. And it kind of started during a Japanese tour in early 96. Um, our equipment took longer. They took, I think they decided to send the equipment to Japan by a cheaper delivery system. It took, it took longer. And we had to stop rehearsing a little earlier before we were ready. And we got to Japan, and the day after the equipment arrived was our first show. 
So all we had to like refresh our brain and whatnot was like the sound check. Mm-hmm. And the show didn't go Hello. great. The show didn't go great. Uh, but we didn't think it was so awful that it would like cause a rift between us and him. Like I, I figured he would at least have the uh, conventional wisdom to know, number one, that nobody was messing up on purpose. And number two, that it had been a hot minute since we actually got to have this music under our fingers, you know? Hmm. So I think we expected him to react uh, a little less incendiary. <laughs> but he was hot, man. Like he basically, after that show, it had to have been probably four or five shows after that before he started speaking to us again. Really? Like, no permit, you know, uh, no cover the sound check and like checking on stage. He'd go to the house with front of house engineer and he'd tell the front of house engineer what he wanted us to do and he'd tell us. Mm. Like, he really, you know, was, he was real upset. And uh, during that time, I think we really kind of, uh, Morris and Tommy and Sonny and I just kind of went, okay, well, I guess he's going to have to feel whatever way he feels about it. You know, and, and, and in a way, it pushed us closer to him. And I think that what he felt was left out. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, I'm just, I'm just going off the dome. Mm-hmm. Any of those dudes could talk to you and refute or say they saw it differently. But my feeling was that his anger pushed us closer together. We were already pretty tight. But by that time, we had had enough of it to the point where we were not afraid to stand up, you know? But he could have thought maybe he sort of lost, uh, I don't want to say lost control of the band, but... but yeah, I mean, or, and I, that, that's a fair assessment. He may have felt that way. And uh, I mean, and we didn't, I mean, he tried to, we had one uh, killer show in that the next like two or three shows. And, you know, it was like, okay, we're not on punishing, punishment anymore. He's being, you know, congratulatory with us. And see, yeah, that's that's what we're supposed to be like. That's how we're supposed to sound every night, so on and so forth. You know, and just kind of going, yeah, okay, man. But, you know, you want the togetherness when it works for you. And you don't want it when it don't. Hmm. So, you know, we were starting to base our interactions with him on a human level and hold them a bit more in regard. I guess is this we we just that situation empowered us, but that was also like you know the the the, the writing was on the wall, man. Mm-hmm. We knew it, it wasn't going to go on much longer after that, and that was January, and it was mid March when he let us go. Had you guys been doing anything with some of the tracks that were going to be on Emancipation, or had he not started any of that? Um, we're on. Um, uh, that's me on Savior. Betcha by golly, wow. Um, one of us, that's that's us. Mm. Okay. And did you already know he, or did you already see there was other, was there, was there always other musicians sort of around that could jump in at any time, or were you not um, aware? I think it, it got to be that way, because I think as as he saw, you know, uh, as, as he experienced, well, I, I think the simple answer is uh, once he saw that it, there was a there was a shelf life, he started reaching out. You know, the, the problem was a lot of the cats who he had out to Paisley to talk about joining the band were like, <laughs> man, you just had them dudes in here and you want me to come after that? Uh, you just had the best band you're going to have. You know, a lot of them would come directly to us after like Prince tried to get me to come out there playing bass. Sonny was out there, man. I'm not in the army. <laughs> Right. If that's what he expects out of me, I, I know, you know. Now, Morris stayed playing with him, right? Well, Morris was fired when the rest of us were. And I neglected to say that I'm the only one who did not return for that meeting. I'm sorry. Okay. They, the other cats went out. I did not. And they were like, well, I think you should have came, man, because you would have had a chance to really, you know, like we really aired our grievances and said everything we needed to say. And it's weird because some people, I, I'll say this. Some people talk to their parents any kind of way. You know what I mean? I mean not a lot of black ones. You know, a lot of black parents are going to stand for that no matter what. But some people talk to their parents any kind of way. And I think that 
the concept of reverential fear is always on the decline. I, you know, at the risk of sounding like, uh, you know, an old man, which I, I'm 50, you know, I'm, I'm at the midway point at least. Yes, sir. <laughs> but, uh, but what I'm going to say is that, you know, we live in an age now where everybody thinks their opinion is, is, is valid. Mm. Like they feel like they should be able to argue with anybody, scholar or not. Postmodernist, mm-hmm. bullshit. Postmodernist, my <laughs> postmodernist <laughs> BS. Yeah. It's, you know, we live in that age where people, I could say something, but you're not, uh, you don't have the knowledge or the experience base to speak. You just need to let people who have been somewhere and done something speak. Mm-hmm. And, or at least first, try to make it a learning moment. Don't try to, to match wits with somebody who their entire life is a subject you just dipping your pinky toe in. That's not smart. Mm. That don't make sense. But, you know, the Internet has made a lot of, you know, what do they call cyber bullies and people who, you know, will say some stuff online that they wouldn't dare figure out to say to you <laughs> right. in person. I was just dealing with a dude a little while ago. On I've, I've been in Soul Asylum for the last 15 years, in case you don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we have, there's there's a fan page for Soul Asylum. And I'm always, well, not always, but I get into conversations with people there who um, seem to be taken aback or they get upset because I get on the, on the, on, on the, uh, the thread and start defending my head. You know, hmm. and then well, this is a public forum. I said, yeah, it is. Now, to be fair, Michael Anthony Dean, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of bands have pages that they don't go on and talk to the fans like that. Right. So it may be a new experience for this dude to be checked by the drummer in the band he's on there complaining about. But if all things being equal, because I'm no respecter of persons, and he doesn't have to be either. He can say what he wants to say. That don't mean I'm not going to be around here and go, uh, <clears throat> first off, you know, people want to talk, talk, talk. But when when you uh, make them accountable for what they say, they, then they shrink up. Then they turn punk. And I'm all for free speech. But if you're going to match which with men, I'm coming. What, what did you say? I'm coming with, with razor blades and lemon juice. <laughs> <laughs> Michael B, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just saying, don't don't <laughs> don't mess with it unless you're ready ready to get really in it. You know what I'm saying? I, I, this hey. is my life. This dude is this dude wants to play with my life. He's he's criticizing decisions that I made for my bad. That that not only that, they're also working. He's just you know, I'm like, yeah. You can I can say what I yeah, you can say what you want. I'm not questioning your freedom to 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 even bash the bad. Right. My question to you is, why are you doing it? What what do you expect to obtain by all this negative rhetoric? You you can do it. Does that mean you got to do it? If you want to go back to Lizzo, yeah, you got your you. It's within your perfect right to do it. But it, does that mean it's to be done? Well, that's the thing. We're in a time now where, like you said, man, if you try to offer correction or at least try to tell mm-hmm. somebody something. They want to spin it as if you are hating or how dare you. But see, that's yeah. a dangerous mm-hmm. thing because without any sort of uh, accountability, people, you know, you have a Trump, you have all this wildness out here. And and for people on these on the web on the websites and stuff, I think a lot of times they don't see you as human or they don't even see you as a real person. It's just like some mm-hmm. thing they they've listened to, so they think they can just say whatever because again, th- there's no accountability. It's, Right. They would never pull up to you personally and say that because they're not built that way. And there sure. would be a certain type of respect if you were to have that conversation with somebody which is lost online. And my question to that, then the real number is, why can't you show me the same respect online that you would if I was speaking to you face to face? That's what I don't get. Yeah. Well, I'm, not, I'm not trying to limit anybody's ability to say anything. But I got, you got something to say? I got something to say. Yeah, I'm I'm there with you, man. Okay, all right. <laughs> and you know that's interesting to, to to have that because obviously with this, you know, the Prince online community is a lot of people saying stuff. There's know? a lot. Well, a lot <laughs> of them, I, you know, that's fair. I, I can't again. I I don't. I I don't even try to talk people out of their experience. People feel 
all sorts of ways about friends, you know, and I don't go out of my way to diminish or, you know, or to try to change their minds or change how they feel about it. I, my, all I want to do is tell the truth from the point, from the viewpoint from which I've seen it, you know? Right. That's it. Well, man, it sounds like y'all about to have a, a rehearsal or something going on. Back there. <laughs> so, so then, my friend Jeff Burnett, he's over here. He's going to play guitar on something for me that I got to get to. Okay, okay. But you want to do a lightning round right quick, uh, uh, Michael Dean? You got any other questions anybody was trying yeah, to ask? Yeah, real quick. Uh, well, here's uh, the one that a lot of people were asking. Uh, they want to know, how, how come you ain't on stage with uh, the MPG touring? Well, <laughs> there's many reasons, but I, the, the what I need to get across is the fact that, like I just said, everybody had their own relationship with that dude, and they feel the way they feel about it. And um, I did the tribute at the Excel Center, and I went, um, you know, I I, I I went along with the process. It, it wasn't it, it wasn't my baby, so I just. You know, ate my food with my mouth closed and I laughed at all, the, you know, ah, ha, 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 great. I just went with the status quo. I wasn't there to try to rock any boats. I was there to try to honor Prince in the best way possible. And, but what I found for me personally is that those situations make me too emotional. Mm. I don't, I don't, uh, it takes me to a place of, of celebration, but sorrow. I don't I, I don't have the emotional constitution to to go out and do that like that. I, I, I you know, I mean, and thank God. I mean, I don't speak for myself. I don't have the need for it, like monetarily or anything else. Like I'm it, it does not it doesn't bring me closure to do that. Got it. I got it. So I, I just I don't I don't need that in my life that way right now. And I'm not saying that they do. They they can do what they want. More power to them, you know? I, I, I support anybody who wants to go out there and do their thing. I don't think anybody should be limited to paying tribute. They can do it whatever way they see fit. If the fans don't like it, they don't have to put their money down for it. You know? These days, you vote with money. <laughs> Or your Facebook posts. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, no. Uh, the real vote. The real vote is the dollar. I feel you. You gonna spend money? Then you know. And you're saying yes. If you don't agree, then keep it in your pocket and say no. I don't. I, I don't think anyone would be begrudge anybody the option to do that. I'm not here to, to criticize anybody. I'm just saying everything ain't for everybody. If they don't want to go, don't go. You know. No, I but you can't you can't make your mind you, you can't well first off you can't tell nobody what to do right <laughs> so just give up the ghost just don't even focus on that <laughs> all right all right um uh, i'm gonna respect your time man because i've had you on here i know you got your things to do no nah, no nah, I'll, I'll give it, i'll give you six more minutes man okay let's, well let's cool. six six more minutes i, I want to make sure that because you didn't just you stop mind, jeff? Right. You, sorry, you're good jeff asking, <laughs> he said, are you good, Jeff? I'm sorry. He's all right. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to show, too, that you didn't stop at Prince. Like, you have a career. You're, you're doing your thing. So I, I'm just looking here out real quick. Uh, you was you went and played with Shaka Khan? Oh, yeah, bit? man. Oh, man. Yes. <laughs> uh, Maxwell. Uh-huh. Ah, I like to see. I'm going I'm to take what I need to take from the way you just answered. <laughs> Oh, what? No, wow, man. I mean, wait. What did you want to know? No, you just said, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I did it. I mean, I mean, it was, I mean, it was a, uh, it was kind of short lived. I'm just oh, saying. Really? Okay. I, well, I mean, what happened literally was um, I was on tour with a French artist at the time, and um, Scotty Baldwin, has he been on your show? Yes, I'm a good friend with Scotty. Scotty Baldwin was mm -hmm. the one who hooked that up. He's the one who oh, so, okay. told Maxwell that I wasn't the Prince anymore, and that if he wanted, you know, if, if if they wanted to reach out, maybe, you know, I, I could join up. Uh, the timing was not um, ideal because Maxwell was in between records okay. and um, he had made some sort of record before Embrya that uh, got shelved. They decided not to put it out. 
and then he worked on, then he put Embry out, and it was, it was a lukewarm response to it, you know, but then Fortunate came out and was like number one for I don't know how many weeks. Mm-hmm. And that like revived everything because there was a tour they had been talking about, but they didn't know when was the right time to do it. And it took a couple of years. So it was, I was on and off with them for a couple of years. And okay. part of that time I, I had been working with, um, with Shaka. And when they finally pulled the trigger on this tour, I had to tell her that I, you know, that I couldn't, couldn't work with her. <laughs> I couldn't tour with her that summer. Wow. And, okay. uh, and Shaka is a, she's a very special person in my life. Um, I, I, number one, she's just, her birthday is the same as my oldest sister. So <laughs> okay. I, I've always uh, heard her voice since I was a kid. And um, all that music, I've known all that music my, my whole life. So <laughs> when I got on that gig, I played it like what those dudes know. You know, right, right. I didn't try to put my spin on it. I said Steve Ferroni played this, so I'm gonna say what, <laughs> and I I did what I what I knew, you know. And Melvin turned around, hey man, hey, all right, man. Oh, I hear you, I hear you, man. So me and Melvin, because Melvin plays a lot like Anthony Jackson did. So me and Melvin together sounded like all them hits, all, all you know, mm-hmm. like it was a real strong musical thing going on. Plus, Shaka plays the house. So she was like really just checking out my style and looking at everything I was doing. You know, and she walked she walked past the drum riser uh, tell me something good because that's when we take the long solos. You know, when everybody gets a solo, she'd walk by the riser play a long solo tonight. <laughs> okay, Shaka. And she'd sit back there you know, chain smoking and watching me while uh while her her stylist was like fixing her hair and you know somebody had the fan on her and you know she's sipping a little grand marnier and she would just be watching me i don't know if i i mean i wouldn't say i was intimidated but knowing how many great drummers had sat in that seat right right you know just for her to even be you know interested was really you know made me feel some kind of way man it was like really that was a really incredible gig for me like she really nice. understood what where I was coming from musically, and I and I I had her too, and every time I see her, it's like it's like we've known each other in a past life or something. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I guess she might say different, but the last time I saw her, we were rehearsing for the uh, the XL tribute, and she walked up, she put her arms around me, and I hugged her, and it was like some kind of weird sort of vibration happened. It was really strange, and she said, "Did you feel that?" I'm like, "Yeah, I don't know what that is." We must have known each other from some other place in time. Mm. It was so strange. Wow. Wow. That's amazing, man. Uh, and then last, second to the lastly, you had a string or uh, were you working with people like Mandy Moore? Uh, yeah, back, I did a lot, back of, lot, of, a lot of studio work that came oh, okay. uh, by way of my friend John Fields, who's um, a, uh, he actually produced the Jonas Brothers and, um, uh, some other, well, all those projects, he was the producer of those records. Okay. And he had moved to LA and um, he just, I, I don't think he really had affinity for um, very many LA musicians, especially drummers. Like most of the drummers he used, they were, they were cats that he had known from a different time. And he had moved away from Minneapolis to go out to LA to, to get his career moving to, the next, moving to the next level. So there was only a couple of cats he would call. It was me and this other drummer, Dorian Crozier, and also um, uh, what's his name? Uh, it's another. I don't know why his name escapes me right now. But another drummer. He played with Elvis Costello. Uh, Pete hmm. Thomas, yeah, incredible drummer. He played with Los Lobos. He played with a bunch of cats. So hmm. it was really just us three for almost the entire time he was out in Los Angeles. So if I was out there, or if there was a budget to fly me out. I, you know, I got in on a lot of stuff because of him. So thank you, John Fields, in case you listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, we're going to wrap this up, man. I, again, I so appreciate you giving us this time and, and sharing right. these stories is like amazing stuff. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of questions based off of this. I really scratched the surface, Michael Dean. Do you want to do a part we two? We can do a part two. Don't play now. This ain't nothing but a word to me. What, well, what, are, you, what are you doing tomorrow around around? Oh, same time. Uh, so I'm supposed to just say yes, but I am a father, 
So I, 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 I understand that <laughs> father duties to Would do. You, well, we'll set me, something. Can I say up. this? Go ahead. Your, your kid, your that girl is so cute. She makes me mad. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just a little take crazy. it how you want. But that kid is so cute. I just I fuck this ball up when I see it. Oh man, I appreciate that, man. <laughs> <laughs> You don't see the other side. <laughs> nah, I'm just I, joking. Hey, listen. I, I mean, I'm a stepdad, so I don't I don't see it like you said, but I do have two stepdaughters. So okay, I, you so know. you know. But that girl is young. I, I, I'm sure everybody in the world has told you, oh, she grows up. Oh, no, she's 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 an angel. She's an angel. All right, man. Um, <laughs> let's uh, well, okay, well, you go. let me know when you want to do it. and We'll, we'll work it out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any uh, where can people find you to get in contact, contact with you or follow you or, or your band? Oh, well, wow. I mean, I mean, I'm on Facebook notoriously. I'm always running my mouth. <laughs> so they can get, they can get at, they can, you can private message me. I'll, I'll, I'll write back. I'm not going to just ignore it. Not, not usually unless it's really about like you know, well, well traveled territory or just, you know, something that's, you know, I'm not going to dignify with a response, but I, 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 I get all kinds. So yeah, I'm, 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 I ain't nobody. Just, just <laughs> DM me, I guess. Oh, oh, you're saying DM. Okay. You want them to get at you. Well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, just really, playing it's like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm as, as my wife or Jeff can, can attest to, I'm a pretty, pretty open book. It's not, you know. All right, all right. So I, I, I'll, I'll take the time to talk to anybody. I'm sure that the fans will appreciate that. Listen, right. ladies and gentlemen, Big Sexy uh, also in the building, sir. Thank you. Yeah, what happened? Did he, did he fall asleep? I, I didn't no, hear no, no, no. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> you, you, you eating your flaming hot Cheetos? You can't talk to me right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll have something for you when we do the, when we do part two. Yeah, I want Big Sexy to ask me some questions there you on go. part two. Part can two, we do that? We can do that. Oh, I want to hear from the man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Uh, we did part one. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed that. Um, please give us any more questions or comments uh, for the next time. As I always say, work it like a job. We'll see you next time. Peace.